Hello, whiskey folk. It's Roy, quarter to ten, another Thursday, another V-Pub. Welcome, everybody. I can see so many of you banging on the doors nice and early again. It's great to welcome you in, and it's fantastic to see you all for another Thursday night. Um, I have a guest this evening. I'll introduce him a little while later. Um, I, uh, I have advertised who it is. It's uh, the guy who's joining me tonight is uh, Scott Adamson from Tomatin. He's uh, one of the global brand ambassadors from Tomatin. And uh, I'm pretty excited to welcome him in, actually. Um, you might have come across Scott in the past. Uh, he is, uh, he's been on a couple of live streams with uh, the Scotch Test Dummies. And uh, you might have bumped into him at festivals and tastings and things up and down the country. And you'll realize, perhaps if you have met him, why I'm, I'm excited to welcome him in on the stream tonight. And I'll talk a wee bit more about that in a minute. Let's jump in and see what you guys are up to and what you're saying. There's just uh, so many of you all saying hello and good evening to me. And I'll say good evening right back. This is about the third VPUB in a row. We're doing weekly streams for December just to see how it goes down. I know that the demand was there. You guys seem to be excited to join me weekly over the winter weeks. So, um, yeah, three in a row now and three collaborations in a row as well. Perhaps next week it'll just be me. We'll see. Let's see who's in tonight. Christina Zerpoli was in nice and early. I believe that you're driving home tonight, Christina. Great to welcome you and nice to see you. Stephen Reynolds is in. Hello, my friend from Ireland. Kenneth Kennelty. Josh Golliday is in. I was speaking to Josh just yesterday. And Josh, I caught some of your stream that you put out last night. I caught little bits of it early this morning. I'll catch the rest later. A very interesting stream again. Kilted Moose, my friend Scott from just across town is in. Christine Deems is in from the States as well. Great to see you, Christine. Alan, the whiskey friend, is in. Caught your Longhorn 16 review, Alan. Fantastic. And I caught some of your uh, Christmas list as well. I think we are very, very aligned on our tastes, Alan, aren't we? Um, uh, BB Jap is in. Woot Aquaviti time. That's a new name to me, unless you're signed in on a different under account. But welcome in, BB. Nice to see you here. Nigel Slynn is in again. Great, Nigel. Keith Corbett. Malt Content. Fantastic. Good to see you joining in from Isengonya Selroy. First time for a live stream from Brisbane, Queensland. Good morning, Andrew, and welcome in. Um, it's very, very nice to welcome you here. Uh, Andy is in, our bag is in, Gus is in, I Laddie is in from the Netherlands as well. Fantastic. Prestige Liquids. No, sorry, you're Andrew. Malt Content, I apologise. But that's somebody else in from Australia. All we need is for day dramming Andrew to join us as well. And we've got a triple in from the Southern Hemisphere, enjoying a nice warm summer, no doubt. Donald Drance is in, Paul Gibbs. Uh, Gregor is in, Gregor McQueen. Great to see you, Gregor. Good to welcome you in again. Stephen Aldridge, Stephen, hi, how are you? Rolf, Whiskey Wolf is in, superb. So many of you joining in, Colors Blue Things. Amy, I hope you're feeling well, Amy. Great to welcome you here. Um, Amy will be here to bully the thumbs out of you. Just a, just a heads up. Mark, my friend Mark from Winnipeg, Whiskey Whistle is in. Great to see you, Mark. Fantastic. He's saying hello, all you whiskey curious cats. Wonderful tip to welcome you all. I'll tell you what I have in my glass tonight. I have something that you've seen me speaking about once or twice in the past. This bottle of Tomat and Legacy is not known as Legacy in the States. I think it's, uh, I always forget what it's called in the States. Is it Dualcas? I think. Um, but I've thrown one of these away in a recycled review. I've thrown, I've thrown a few more of these away since that. Um, and it also appeared as a recommendation at the end of my ABCD video. Now, the reason I did that is I went through these four pillars, these four checklists of whiskey presentation that you hear me banging on about regularly. Um, and that's A for age statement, B for bottling strength, C for chill filtration, and D for dye, so adding color to whiskey. But at the end of that video, what I wanted to do was put in three recommendations that, that flew in the face of that, that I was still enjoying despite that. And it was Glen Scotia, Double Cask, Deanston Virgin Oak, and this from Tomatin, the, the legacy. Now this is um, very, very reasonable and cheap to pick up. It's less than 30 pounds all the time, but you can often pick it up on special offer. And my local Tesco, my supermarket here, has taught me over the years and months, not to pay a list price for this. If I'm patient and if I wait, I can pick this up for 23, 24 pounds. 
Now, this makes it fantastic value because I thoroughly enjoy this whiskey. And at that price, it's very, very easy for me to share by the glass and the bottle. It's a very relaxed sipping whiskey that you don't really need to spend too much brain power enjoying. It's just an easy drinker and it's good quality. Yes, there's virgin oak at play here, but the virgin oak is delicately balanced. It doesn't overpower. On the nose, I've been picking it up tonight. I always get fresh pineapple from this and I'm getting that tonight, kind of a clean white stone fruit, kind of peachy notes and things. It's very malty. There's lots of kind of sweet caramels and vanillas and things. But again, if you don't want to analyze it, it's a lovely, comfortable sipper. So I was curious when we talk about that theme of the ABCDs, and then we talk about drams like this that so many of us are still able to enjoy, I hope. Why are the producers doing this? Why are some whiskies 40%, 43%? Why are they, perhaps, they don't have the natural presentation identifiers on there where they don't admit anything about colouring or chill filtration? Why does that exist, especially from distilleries where you very much know that natural presentation is something that they're willing to bring to us and other expressions? That's one of the reasons I wanted Scott to join me tonight. So before I introduce Scott a wee bit later, have a think about those concepts. And if any questions pop into your head, if you're curious about anything, let us know. I can see my friend the Whiskey Rev is in already, and Jason uh, Vaswani, Jason Whiskey Wise, has told me that he'll be joining as well. So there'll be two moderators in to help me in sending me through some direct messages as well, so that hopefully I can catch your questions for the guys, and we can um, we can have some, even if it's slightly awkward questions. I don't think there's anything that this guy hasn't had to handle, certainly when it comes to whiskey related questions, of course, before. Fantastic. So let's see what you guys are saying. Uh, 30 quid, Malt Content is saying, will buy you only an empty bottle in Australia, Roy. I know there are countries out there that do have to pay a wee bit more to enjoy their whiskies. Australia, Canada, some of the uh, countries out in Asia as well. I know what it's like. And sometimes I'm very aware of that when I'm talking about prices. Um, we're not the cheapest. I'm actually amazed how cheap whiskey can be in places like Germany, for example. But yeah, I'm very aware that we often have quite good deals here. Uh, J.W. Bassman is in, good to see you, my friend. He's saying um, that he's made it tonight. It's really nice to welcome you in. Um, let's, uh, the chat has skipped away from me. Everwind is in saying, ahoy, great to welcome you in, Everwind. Wonderful as always. Jonathan Timms, that looks like a new name. And he's he sent me a, a virtual dram. Thank you very, very much, Jonathan, and welcome in. And he's saying, thanks for the magic of Isla. Ah, so you've maybe discovered the channel through the magic of Isla video. That's fantastic, Jonathan. Thank you very much, my friend, and thank you for your virtual dram. Very glad you enjoyed it. Uh, Whiskey Wolf is saying, having a moment here, first sip of a Cadenhead's Mortlac 29 sherry cask at 55.1. Yeah, Rolf, I can imagine you would be having um, a moment with a 29-year-old Mortlac from Cadenhead's. Sounds wonderful. Toon is in, Toon Van Rouge. Hey, Roy, did you try the Aberlour cask? And not yet. I haven't yet. Um, I believe that that one is, the, is that more ex-bourbon cask? Um, I haven't even seen it on the shelf. There's just so many whiskies just now that there's lots and lots of new ranges. Think of the new ranges that's just been launched and in retail just now from Old Pulteney, from Glenrothes, from Glenallachy, from Mortlach. You know, all of these new, it's not just new single expressions, it's whole entire ranges. And I'm already buckling under <laughs> the strain of this um, nonsense spending embargo that I put on myself where I said during November I'm going to try not to spend anything on whiskey. I spent more on whiskey in November than I have the rest of the year because of all the new whiskies that came out, all the offers that were on. It was ridiculous. I'm, I'm worried about counting the cost now. Sid Martin is in. Great to see you, Sid. He's saying evening all. Gregor is saying insanity from some scotch can be cheaper to buy out of Scotland only to live her back into country of origin. That's Yeah, that's isn't that just the way of it? I find that with a lot of expressions that it can be bought cheaper outside of the country. It's obviously taxing issues at play there. The doc is in. Hello, good to see you, my friend McAllen, fine and rare. 
he's saying it's 17, so it's 1899 in Germany for the legacy, 17 pounds. Quite incredible. And therein lies a clue that we can talk about perhaps a wee bit later. Freddie Fender is in. Good to see you, Freddie. That looks like a new name. Question for Mr. Mr. Adamson. Okay, I'm going to try to remember that, Freddie. Um, perhaps the moderators, maybe the Rev, can pick up Freddie Fender's question for Stuart. So, sorry, for Scott. Um, and uh, maybe Scott has actually picked it up because he's already in on the chat. Fantastic. Whiskey Freedom is in. Art Baggy, Daniel Vermas from Hungary. Good to see you again, Daniel. And uh, just so many of you joining tonight. Wonderful to see you all. Now, let's pull up my chat window here so that I can get back to my uh, friend. Just make sure that everything is muted apart from him. So uh, Scott Adamson, as I say, is global band, brand ambassador for Tomatin. But what you'll find is um, not only is he a very, very laid back guy, um, but more than anything, I think, as you talk to him and as if, if you've ever met him or if you've ever seen any of the streams or tastings that he's been involved in, what comes across is the, that he is, in fact, very much at heart a whiskey geek. He's a passionate fan and enthusiast of whiskey, and that comes across. So he's a very interesting guy for me to speak to, and recently I met up with him at the Glasgow Whiskey Festival. And I tried to keep the time speaking to him as neat as possible. And we just spent five, 10 minutes, I don't know, not much more than that talking. But what came across very, very clearly that we were very, very aligned on pretty much everything that we were talking about. Our view of whiskey, our understanding of whiskey, our appreciation of whiskey. And it seemed that a lot of the whiskey that we were enjoying were very, very similar as well. I left him with a sample, for example, of the Lot 40 cast strength because I heard that he was indeed a fan of it. So I would like to welcome in the first brand ambassador that I've had on this stream. Um, and it's great that he's a brand ambassador, but I think that very, very quickly, you'll realize um, that at heart, he is a whiskey geek. Scott, if you're able to unmute yourself, I'm hoping that people will be able to hear you. Good evening, Roy, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you nice and clear. It's yes. wonderful to welcome you in, my friend. How are you there? I'm very good. Thanks for having me on. You're very, very welcome. What are you... It doesn't look like you're in Tomatin surroundings. Where are you? No, I'm at home right now. Um, those of you that saw the Scotch Test Dummies uh, live streams that we had, they were a little bit earlier in the evening, so I would be down at the distillery. Um, I live about half an hour, 45 minutes away from the distillery now, and... Um, we have our Christmas dance tomorrow, so there's a lot of preparation going and getting involved for that. So there's a lot of my wife's running around in the background, getting clothes together and everything. So um, good to be at home tonight. So this is a distraction for you to put your feet up and enjoy a dram with us, right? Well, the more the more I drink tonight, the later I get to go into work tomorrow morning. So <laughs> all good. Ah, fantastic. I mean, we don't usually have too much on these streams, but I think a couple of the drams that you and I have penciled in a wee bit later are cast strength. I'm looking forward to those. Talking about cast strength, did you have a chance to try the, the Lot 40 that I, I left with you at the festival? I did have a try, yeah. Probably um, just the past weekend there, I had a little dram of it. And I think the point that you raised was absolutely perfect. We didn't actually talk too much about tasting notes or the analysis of it, but what you said was very much that this is a whiskey that you cannot have on front of friends because you lose track of the conversation and it just sucks you right into the whiskey. Absolutely. I was really shocked and surprised by it. Um, I knew it was going to be a good whiskey because I'd heard so many people talking about it. Um, it was gifted to me by my friend in Canada, Daniel Whiskey Throttle. He was excited to share it with me. Um, so I was kind of expecting something. But I, I uncorked that and tasted that on a live stream. And uh, you can imagine the issue there is, is that you're you're really being, and so many whiskies are like that, it really sucks you right in and you just, it's almost like you have to remem remind yourself that there are people watching, right? Yeah. It's funny. I mean, Lot 40 is a, a brand that every time I've gone over to Canada with work, I've taken a bottle or two back and I found it to be just a perfect sipping Canadian whiskey. And then when when you brought the sample of this to me i was expecting something along the same line something that i could sip definitely it's going to be a bit more intense and a bit more going on but 
no, it's, it totally pulls you away from what you're doing. Absolutely. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I, I can't remember how much I gave you, but um, that bottle of Lot 40 Cast Strength only has about maybe three or four drams left in it now because um, I just shared it with absolutely everybody because it's a very, very tricky whiskey yeah. um, uh, for folks to get a hold of outside of Canada. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad you were able to enjoy it. That's not what you've got in the glass tonight. Are, I nope. think you and I are sipping the same thing. That's right. I've got a glass of the Legacy with me at the moment. Well, I think I get the impression, and we, I think we'll talk about that first, because I know that we're not going to spend the evening talking about Tomatin. I mean, you, you're not working right now. But I would like to take the opportunity of you being on to talk a little bit of, about Tomatin as well. Um, these are boom times for Scotch whiskey. And I don't think that there's a brand that I could reach out and grab right now that demonstrates that more than Tomatin. You guys are having some fun times right now, right? Yeah, it's 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 a lot of fun. That's probably the best word to use right now. I think what's interesting about Tomatin's history is that it has very much tra tracked alongside the fortunes of the whiskey industry as a whole. You know, the distillery was built in 1897, right at the height of the Victorian whiskey boom. Then after the Patterson crash, it went into liquidation. It was revived. Then after the Second World War, it grew to become the biggest distillery that had ever existed in Scotland by the 1970s, fueling the blended industry. And then in the 1980s, went into liquidation again. But over the last uh, 20 years, we've focused more on brands and on, over the last 10 years on our single malt brand. And that very much fits into what we're seeing now. You know, there are boom times for Scotch, but what the bigger trend is, is a premium spirits boom, you know, and when you relate that to what's going on in Scotch whiskey, it's a single malt boom. And this is something we've never seen before. You know, Whis single malt whiskey is stealing market share away from blended whiskey for the first time ever. Um, and it's been going on for a long time now. Um, whereas blend kind of goes up and down year on year, single malt has constantly been, been growing. Um, and it's, it's coming from a demand of, you know, there's a there's more money in the world, there's more people with cash on the hip than there ever has been before. But I think when it comes to Scotch whiskey and the reason that people latch on to Scotch whiskey and um, evangelize it like we're doing tonight, it's because of this growing um, interest in what we have in the glass. Consumers are more discerning than they've ever been before. And they want to know the nuances and they want to know about the liquid itself rather than the story of the nice little hill that you're on or the, the soft waters. They want to know about how that whiskey has been produced more than ever before. I might have mentioned to everybody that Scott speaks a very similar language to mine. And uh, I hope that what he's just said there demonstrates that. I was speaking to Josh Golliday last night and Josh asked me this question directly. He, he asked me, he said, you know, we, we are nervous about um, how, how much uh, enjoyment we're having out of this boom. The fact that uh, everybody's interested in whiskey, it's becoming a much, much more popular subject. When is it going to end? And that's what I tried to um, discuss with uh, Josh. I tried to say, you know, this is different from... Uh, the brown liquid booms that we've seen in the past, where we talked about whiskey as a very generic thing, where it was kind of driven by Hollywood post-war, where it was driven by the fact that it was just the popular and available alcohol in the late 19th century and things. It's very, very different, as Scott just said, and I think that fits in with a discerning modern um, culture who are also mindful of well-being, where if they're going to drink alcohol, which at its core is a poison, um, they want to drink less and better. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, I think that that's one thing that I get asked quite a lot is we're in a scotch boom right now. Is it a bubble? When will it burst? When will we go bust? And, you know, my, my background is I studied history. So I'm always a little bit pessimistic about good times because I know that bad times do follow. So when we started talking about this, I had a little bit more time to think about that. And what I get to is I think that definitely in time there will be a plateauing effect, but I don't think we will, knock on wood, you know, my job depends on it, I don't think we will ever see a bust like we did in the past. And I think part of that is because the 1890s, it was very much Scotch whiskey was the spirit. You know, you had a group of people from England who no longer could get their hands on brandy and they moved to Scotch. 
Then in the 1980s, you've got America coming on in the market. You know, at the end of the Second World War, 50% of the whiskey was still sold in the UK. And then you've got America yes. coming in. And in the 1970s, they make up 42% of the market. And it's still very much a Scotch whiskey boom. And then people turn to vodka. And so there's a couple of things going on there. There's now more markets drinking whiskey than ever before. To Matt and ourselves, we export to over 60 markets worldwide. You know, when we went bust in the 1980s, we were shipping to America and Japan. So that's a huge difference. Now, don't get me wrong. If America was to stop buying whiskey and reintroduce prohibition, it would have a massive, massive impact. But it wouldn't cripple the company in the way it did in the past. There would be definite changes, but I don't think the doors would shut. And the other thing that's going on as well is this idea of turning away from Scotch whiskey onto another spirit. Well, Scotch whiskey is kind of going hand in hand with every premium spirit in the world right now. And I think what we'll maybe see is people that are picking up a craft gin and tonic or sipping on a tequila or whatever that may be, will in time advance to drinking Scotch whiskey, which is still a, a more a difficult a product, a more difficult liquid to get involved with because of the fact that we, we drink it at such a high strength, you know. But I think the reasons that Scotch whiskey went bust in the past are very different to the industry that we have right now. Now, that's not to say that something can't go wrong, you know. A third of our market is the EU, and obviously Brexit causes some concerns with that. So there's always going to be economic uh, factors at play, but there's not so many things stacking up. I mean, the way we control produ production is much more in line with what the market is needing than it ever was in before. So the, the levels of overproduction that we had in the past, they probably won't come about again. Well, let's talk about that just before we switch away from this legacy and pour another dram, because what you mentioned there, um, you're talking about these, these whiskies and the Scotch whiskey that was being made in the past, what was eventually having to try and compete with vodka. Um, and at that time, you know, the nice sparkling wines and this kind of wine boom that came along at a similar time as well. You know, the, the, it was very, very different whiskey. Now, it was made very similar, similarly to as today, but it was presented very differently as well. The concept of any whiskey being bottled higher than well, 40% domestically, occasionally 43% for export, that was virtually unheard of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at that time, um, the palate was light. You know, if you consider the style of whiskey being drunk, at that time, peated whiskey was seen as, uh, smoke in whiskey was seen as an off note, you know, and that's totally different from what we're dealing with today. People were looking for, and it's a word that I, I I don't enjoy using because I don't think it's as descriptive as we need to be about whiskey, but the word smooth, that's what people wanted. They wanted a glass of whiskey, a glass of scotch that they could sip. And that's what 40% did. Um, we talked a little bit about it before, that there's very few spirits in the world that people are expected to drink at 40%. You know, um, If you think about gins and vodkas and rums and things, a lot of the time it's getting mixed, whereas then we expect people to drink 40% alcohol. And for the vast, vast majority of drinkers in the world, 40% alcohol is still a barrier to entry. You know, We're in the position where we've been drinking whiskey for long enough to get used to 40%, move up to 46% and the depth that comes with non-chill filtered whiskey, move into cask strengths, single casks and things like that, to the point that you can be sipping a 60% bourbon quite comfortably and that this is something that you mentioned last night you know but i think what we as whiskey geeks and i use that term affectionately not um disparagingly uh, we as whiskey geeks have to be aware that the vast 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 majority of people drinking whiskey at the moment 40 percent is still a high uh, strength for them you hear so many uh, stories about people having a bad experience with whiskey and very often that's because it was a whiskey that was too challenging for where their palate was at that time. And I would challenge anyone who um, talks down on 40% or talks down on 43% to go back to that first single malt that drew you into the category or what that first whiskey. You know, for me, it was Jura Superstition, 43% uh, whiskey. Um, now, is that my favorite whiskey? No. And it's, I don't even have a bottle of it at the moment. But 
that was the whiskey that drew me into the category and i've moved on forever always hold a wee place in your heart as well for that reason and i think that even people that get drawn in by smoky peaty whiskies which is often a very good converter i find despite the myth about it being the opposite end they tend to be drawn in by the Lafroy 10s at 40, 43, Lagville and 16 at 43. These whiskies that are um, certainly powerful in flavor, but lighter on ABV. Absolutely. And I think that comes from, you know, th there's almost a, I think from the whiskey industry out, if I'm doing a tasting, you, you kind of expect to be doing a, a whiskey festival that people have a basic understanding of flavor. And maybe that's a, a not a, an effective thing on my part to have that misconception but i think when it comes to heavily smoky whiskies that is a very identifiable flavor and for someone new to the category starting to explore that they can say oh yeah i get that flavor i understand what you're talking about here whereas something like tomatin which has a lot more nuances uh, quite a lot of subtleties to it it's not so in your face that in itself can be quite challenging if the if what you want to get out of whiskey is to be able to tell people what you taste in the glass. Yes, people are looking for hooks. People are looking for hooks, absolutely. Um, and uh, talking of hooks, while I, I read out a, a question, I'm just going to ask you what we're pouring next out of the two drams over your shoulder. But Andy Arbaggi has asked a question. He said, and there's a, quite a few questions come in being fed to me by the Whiskey Rev. I'm going to try and get through as many of them as I can when we pause for a second, but Andy's asked, can you ask Scott if Alistair is still working or has he retired? He is very close to my heart and a top man. Now, I know with Alistair that he's talking about, he's talking about Alistair much, right? Yeah, much, yeah, he's still working, he's still working. He's, uh, Alistair's our UK sales manager. Um, and so he still does a lot of the shows. He was at the Glasgow Whiskey Festival uh, a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago now with myself. And yeah, no, you'll still see Alistair out and about I'll tell you a wee story, Andy, about Alistair. Um, we had a fantastic tasting with him at the Good Spirits Company. Uh, must must be a couple of years ago now, but he was very, very laid back and down to earth. Very realistic guy to talk to as well. Wonderful tasting. But at the end of the tasting, he had one of the Kubokins, one of the vintage Kubokins. I think it was in the 88 or 89. I don't remember which. But my brother had just recently bought the 88 directly from him at a tasting down in Wiltshire. And I just casually mentioned this. And he looked at me and he said, is your brother Craig? And I said, yes. And he remembered my brother from a tasting 500 miles away. Quite incredible. Yeah, he's, he's one of those guys, you know. Uh, it's, it's almost the traditional UK alcohol sales rep. That's Alistair Tutti, a very personable, personable guy. My friend, the Whiskey Rev, is fantastic at that. He can meet a group of people and, and hear all their names and where they're from. Um, and this comes in very handy for him, as, he, as, he, as I guess he's doing his VIP thing at McAllen, right? But um, uh, he's able to remember their names and where they're from. And, uh, and I remember him telling me that, that you know, people say that they're, a, they're a poor at that and it just takes a bit of effort and application. And it's something that slowly but surely I'm getting a wee bit better at. But Alistair came across as one of those guys that had already worked out that that was a cool and important thing. Yep. Um, so I guess you can pass on um, Andy, who is uh, our baggy, or um, Andy Perslow, pass on uh, his regards to Alistair when you see him. I will do. I'm going to just, if you decide what we're drinking, um, Scott, I'm going to bring over some questions that you can chew on uh, while we pour. Okay. Um, let's start with, wow, there's quite a lot come in. Great. Let's go right up to the top. Uh, Freddie Fender, who I mentioned earlier, saying his question for Mr. Adamson. One of my first, most favorite whiskies is Tomatin 15 American Oak. Nice. It's okay. travel retail exclusive. Any chance that might change? Wow, I'm looking at all these questions that's coming in. We need to just keep the answers as brief as we can, Scott. Yeah. Um, any chance that might change? Will it stay somewhat available? So he's talking about the travel retail American Oak. Yeah, that's going to stay in travel retail. That was until about 2013, part of our core range. We pulled the 15 year old out of the core range purely because of um, I, I want to try something different. So we, we came about with our 14 year old Portwood as a replacement for that. Um, but the 15 year old will remain part of the travel retail range. 
Okay, good news for Freddie Fender then. It was one of his favourites. He's still going to be able to buy. He just needs to fly to buy it, right? Uh, Simon Ray is asking, anybody, uh, any thoughts on a good dram to go to with Christmas dinner? Uh, I would suge suggest that you would be amazed how any dram in hand goes very, very well with Christmas dinner. What about something, what would you recommend? And it doesn't have to be a tomato and scotch. Just throw out any, anything that you might be considering for your Christmas dinner. Um, what have I got over here? I have got a bottle of Jura 21 year old, an old bottling actually. It's a, I think it was released in 2000. Uh, so I'm going to have that open on Christmas. There we go. Fantastic answer. Stephen Reynolds from Ireland is saying, uh, which uh, Irish whiskey has seen a massive boom recently of new distilleries and bottlings, even older distilleries. Has this happened in Scotland? And any would you recommend we haven't heard of? Absolutely. The boom is happening in Scotland, very much so. I don't know how Scott feels about this, but it seems like every other week you hear about a new distillery that's in planning, um, it's under construction already, or they've started to, um, uh, to advertise the fact that they're going to be making whiskey again. Um, it's very much boom times. Um, but what we're seeing is Scott's already just touched upon is rather than these kind of big factories being set up to make the 12 million litres that Tomatin would have once made in the 70s, what we're seeing is much more granular effect where there's lots of smaller distilleries opening. Would you agree, Scott? Absolutely, absolutely. Scotland is going crazy at the moment. It's a little bit like the only time you can compare this to is the 1890s. You know, we're getting 10, 15 distilleries opening a year almost, it seems, at the moment now. For me, I do worry a little bit about the future of all of them, if I'm being totally honest, because how many people are going to want to buy a bottle of three-year-old whiskey at £100? That's just throwing that question out there. Um, and I do worry that some of these distilleries are maybe coming a little bit late to them, but I would like to be proved wrong. But just on the, the point of Irish whiskey there, if you see it about pick up a bottle of Method and Madness, uh, I tried that recently and it's absolutely stunning stuff. I think Stephen Reynolds is one of the guys that'd be very familiar with the method in madness. Um, one of my other friends, uh, Phil from Ireland, sent me over quite a few um, different uh, method in madness uh, samples. One of them was aged in a chestnut cask, um, which was very, very interesting as well. Um, but like you say, for the whiskey geeks out there, and the whiskey geek culture is growing, I say whiskey geeks, I mean just enthusiasts in general, and um, you don't need to be a geek to enjoy this stuff, right? But, um, you know, the whiskey enthusiasts, people that are buying whiskey to to try and taste and contrast. Just quickly, I noticed that there's a super chat in from my friend over in Texas. Bobby Parnell has sent me across a dram. Thank you very, very much, Bobby. You haven't even said anything. You haven't taken the opportunity to ask a question or speak to me, but I appreciate your support, my friend. I know you've been supporting me for a long time, and it's always very, very much appreciated. If I can get Scott to nominate what I'm pouring next, I'll raise a glass to you, Bobby. What are we having, Scott? I think we'll go on to the Aaron for the moment. Okay, so we're having, a, and I have batch four, and I think you have a different batch, right? You have. I've got batch one, and I'm surprised I've still got anything left in the bottle of it. That's because you left it at your grandest house. That's true. That's very true. <laughs> I've got batch four, and uh, it's the, only the second time that I've. Well, that's not true because I've I've tasted it before. But actually, having a, a bottle at home, this is the first bottle I've had at home. And this is only the second time I've actually poured it. Um, I just had a little dram out of it on uh, Monday evening, I think. So this is a, the, um, maybe you can explain a wee bit about this whiskey and why you nominated this for us to share. Yeah, so we're um, drinking the Bothy at the moment. And this came about, we were talking a little bit about the whiskey industry as a whole and the job as a brand ambassador. You know, it's a festival and it's a little bit like a moving circus so your best friends quickly become people that work at other distilleries and for a good few years I've been very friendly with a few folk at um, Aaron Distillery and I know you talked about Andy Bell in a um, recent podcast and we've traveled uh, around countries on trains together held tastings together gone on holiday together and for me Aaron is a whiskey that very much embodies the way the whiskey industry works and its friendship, you know. Um, and I think what I really like about Aaron is, I think if Tomatin was to have opened in 1995, we'd be doing a very, very similar thing to Aaron. And we've got a very similar outlook on how whiskey should be made available. Um, now, going back to that moving circus thing, I've got three bottles of Aaron in the house at the moment, and I've not paid a penny for any of them because it's one of those Within the industry, there's a lot of bottle tradings, and uh, the Bothy was uh, myself and our uh, one of our sales managers took a trip over to Aaron, and we were hosted at the distillery by James McTaggart, 
And of course, we bought him a bottle of Tomat and 18 year old. And for thanks, he gave us a bottle of the Bothy back. So um, I thought it was a great chance to talk about a fascinating distillery. You know, uh, Roy had mentioned, let's find a distillery that we both like. And the first name I threw out was Aaron and it fell on uh, very happy ears, I think. Absolutely. And I think that I remember a time that I tried Aaron in the past and you can argue that I wasn't ready for Aaron or Aaron wasn't ready for me. But um, I think that regardless of which side of that argument you would choose to pick, Aaron has come of age now and Aaron are able to produce just this year. Now in the shops now, there's a 21 year old Aaron that everybody is talking about. Um, and it's amazing to me that there's a 21 year old Aaron out there that you can buy. Right. Um, and and I think that, you know, when you when you taste the 10, when you taste the 12, when you taste the 14, the 18, whichever one of those, the standard core range just now, not only is it presented very nicely, thank you very much, Aaron, but it's delicious and engaging whiskey. They are they are exercising their craft very, very well right now. And I thought when you suggested that we share an Aaron, I was pretty excited about it. Yeah. Yeah. This is um, to me, this is very this is like cask strength citrus yeah very very obviously the cereal is there the malt is there There's, there is some vanilla and sweetness but what i'm getting is is lots of bright fresh zesty citrus from this yeah so what we're drinking is the bothy i've got batch one roy's got batch four and so the story here very much seven years and first full bourbon barrels then it says on the back 18 months but from the discussion i had with andy is two years in um, quarter casks um, and it's just a massively oily lovely whiskey it brings in that wood very nicely but balances out with the distillery character and for me before i ended up putting this bottle to my granda's house uh, i don't know how it even ended up there this had quickly become my hip flask whiskey you know it was the whiskey that i was taking to dances kaylee's weddings hill walks it's just a perfect whiskey in that situation and i think a perfect winter warmer tonight once we transcend from that the zesty freshness on the nose and the arrival there it kind of trans the, the sweetness comes in uh, a little bit that texture you would talk about certainly helps helped by the abv no doubt but the finish is all about the spice and the and the heat right mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It just develops in the mouth from being quite a lively citrusy thing into that tingly spices that, you know, the, the, my bottle here, I don't know what yours is at, Roy, but I'm at 55.7%. And I don't feel the need to add water to this. I think this is very drinkable as it is. I certainly will add a drop to see how it develops. But I think it's a very drinkable. Because I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't reaching, reaching for the water, water either, either, but I'll do the same thing. Mine is a little bit lighter at 53.8. Um, we've got uh, Orbosphere is saying, did a fantastic tour at Tomata in 2015 with Scott. Wow. He showed us every nook and can cranny of the distillery, and we tasted 12 single cask whiskies, including a 1976 straight from the cask. Wow, Scott, I'm coming in for you. You're hosting my tour, if that's what you put on. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> if if I'm going to be taking you to taste whiskies, I'm going to have a glass with me as well. Well, well, that's 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 half of it, right? I mean, it's it's um it's one of these things that you can enjoy whiskey vicariously if you have to be the driver and things. It, it's not difficult to get into it and enjoy it, but there's nothing like um, visiting a distillery and being able just to just kind of. Get, it's almost like stepping into the clothes of the distillery to stand in the warehouse and sip the whiskey, to relax in the tasting room and be hosted by somebody who's telling you why it is what it is and things. Absolutely. And if you're the host, it's nice to be able to partake yourself a little bit. I know that not all distilleries are able to do that. Yeah. Whiskey Throttle is saying, a, I, he, this is the guy that, that um, gave me the lot 40, Scott. He's saying right. he's so happy that I, I shared it so much. And he said, plus with Scott, I met him five or so years ago, had been a fan of Tomat ever since, drinking a 1988 25-year-old as he watches. There you go. So, so the guy that Perfect. shared the Lot 40 with me, which subsequently yeah. meant, meant that you got to enjoy that bottle from, from me, is... Was uh, this in Canada that we met? I, I suspect it would have been in Canada. About five years ago, I was over in Alberta for a couple of weeks. He's in Alberta. Right, okay. Alberta. So it's probably then that you would have met Daniel. He's got yeah. a formidable uh, depth of understanding of whiskey, Daniel, and a fantastic collection as well. 
Perfect. Um, just, to, just to quickly touch back on what you were saying about the tours there as well, you know, we're talking a lot about presentation tonight and natural presentation. I don't think anything sums up natural presentation like a tour at Tomatin. You know, the, the tour guides don't have a script. They have some facts that they need to know. And then it's just personality. We've got a fascinating story to tell there. And it's the only distillery in Scotland that you can get inside the old mash tun and have a look about. And you can have a look at a condenser in more detail. So there's we, we show you everything. And if, any question you can ask, we'll do our best to answer. So I just wanted to touch on that, what we mentioned, the tours there. Fantastic. You know, I have to be honest that despite having driven past to Matt on numerous occasions, been very, very handy on the A9 like it is, I have never taken a tour. Yeah, you know, we, we, we hear that a lot, but what's quite amazing is when we talk about the current whiskey boom, last year we, we welcomed 50,000 people through the door, you know, so it's, uh, although it's quite funny to hear at a whiskey festival, the amount of people like yourselves that, that do drive past on the direction to another distillery or to a, a, another experience in the north, but the vast majority of people coming to us are tourists on holiday in Inverness and Aviemore and experiencing whiskey for the first time through the the bottom of a tomato glass, which is absolutely fantastic. <laughs> absolutely. And it's not often, you know, it's not always that I'm on the way to some someplace else. It's just that when you're traveling around with family, they're not yet at the age that I can convince them that a distillery visit is a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, Daniel Vermas, thanks for the heads up. Daniel, he's saying that I was getting some feedback and some uh, on on the audio. So um, hopefully I've addressed that and it's working a wee bit better. Let's grab another couple of questions. Um, the whiskey, the doc, McAllen Fine Rare is saying, a question to Scott, what is it like to be owned by a Japanese company? And I, and I noticed that there was uh, another couple of questions along a similar theme coming in as we were chatting earlier. Mm -hmm. But um, it was the first Japanese interest in Scotch whiskey, right? But I think, yeah. I certainly get the impression but that you're left to do your own thing. I, I, I don't want to say it was the first Japanese interest, purely because the way it's always been worded to me is the first fully owned Japanese uh, Scottish distillery. So I suspect that with that wording, there was Japanese interest in Scottish distilleries beforehand. But the history there is very much that our biggest uh, customer in the 1980s, before we shut down, was a Japanese customer buying uh, Scotch whiskey in bulk and shipping it to Japan. So when we went into liquidation in 1984, this company, Takara Shutso, decided that rather than lose the supply of whiskey, they would buy the distillery. Now, you're absolutely right, we do get left to our own devices, and I would say we are no less an independent distillery than any other independent distillery out there. You know, our headquarters are on site, which when you think of other Highland distilleries, I wonder, I don't know many other Highland distilleries that have their headquarters on site, and all the decisions made about what we put in the bottle, how we distill, how we mature stock, are made on site. Now, we absolutely send our budget every year over to Japan and get their approval. And um, But for the last 10 years, we've been achieving budget. So everything's going pretty good at the moment. Now, I, one of the ways I always try and explain to people just how good it is to work for these guys, Tomatin, um, through its history, by virtue of its location, needed to have houses on site for the workers. You know, um, we became the biggest distillery in the 1970s, so we have... 30 houses on site that were built as workers accommodation. Now, if you're a company coming in with the intention of making money, the first thing you do when you buy that distillery in the 1980s is sell all the houses on the private market. Tomatins, to the best of my recollection, the last distillery in Scotland to provide housing to the majority of the workers. 80% of the staff still get given a house as part of their um, remuneration with the company, you know. So, that that's a great way of showing just the, the culture that we have as a company yes we have japanese shareholders but we're very much um 50 people in the middle of the scottish highlands making whiskey the way we want to make it presenting it the way we want to present it and selling it the way we want to sell it and certainly your focus increases um is increasing to be presenting the best single malt representation of the distillery that you can right Absolutely. I mean, if you look at what Tomatin did in the past, it was absolutely quantity, you know, quantity driven. In the 1970s, I'll, I'll throw a, a stat out there for you. In the 1970s, we did 79 mashes every week. 
and that's an eight ton mash 79 times time, times a week that's massive massive volumes of whiskey nowadays our focus is very much more on quality rather than quantity and the distillery manager that we have now for the last i want to say six or seven years graham Munson, he came to us um, he had been the distillery manager at Glenmorangie for 13 years. He then reopened Glenglassa Distillery and then he came to us. So his um, approach to whiskey making is very much a quality driven one rather than a quantity driven one. So small things that he's done, we've moved from an unbalanced to a balanced still house. It just allows for a more consistent spirit to come off the still, give us better batch control over what's coming through. So that's all these small tweaks, that's what's been going on. Yeah. That's that's very interesting. Um, I, I'm just going to mention there's a couple of guys. Gre uh, Gregor is in from France. Good to see you, Gregor. And he's asking um, if there's even any point trying to get your attention from the chat. What I would say, Scott, and I think you might be okay with this, is that I'm not going to get through all the questions that you have for Scott tonight. What to do, not in the live stream chat, but actually in the comments under this video, leave your comments for Scott. And I'm sure Scott would be very, very happy to go in after the event when he's got some time and answer your individual questions on the video on YouTube. Are you okay with that, Scott? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can, as well as that, you can engage with me on Instagram as much as you like. It's Scotch Adamson is the handle, or you can email me scott at tomatin.com. Very simple email address. Any questions you have, send them my way. I can't promise to get back to you very quickly. Tomorrow's my last day in the office uh, before Christmas, but I will absolutely get the answer to your question. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do then. I think that I'm all very much the action of one benefits all. So if you want to send a private personal message to Scott, absolutely. But if it's a general whiskey question that we could all benefit from, like so many of these questions that I'm not going to be able to get to are, put it in the comments on the YouTube video, because that means that's part of the, the, the fantastic thing that's building on YouTube is this library of intelligence. It's not just the reviewers that's creating the content, through the dialogue that happens in the live streams, through the comments and the replies to the comments that happens underneath the videos, there is gold building there. There is insight and information and intelligence and often very, very rational points made. Something that's not normal for YouTube, I'll admit, but it's very much inside the whiskey community and YouTube. So I would encourage you um, to do that. And I'm sure I could convince Scott to take some time out of his lazy day getting ready for the Christmas party tomorrow. <laughs> to answer some questions on YouTube for you. I'll just throw in quickly to this one. Um, uh, we've got uh, Bronco Rog out, out in the States, I think, uh, Rog, you are. He's saying he, he always has a tomato in his bar and their quality price ratio is unparalleled and he appreciates it. Certainly that's a lot of feedback I get from the States is that you guys have done a very good uh, value quality balance act over in the States and you're reaping the rewards of that now, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. John, uh, that's a new name to me, John, I'm going to try and pronounce this Werfgum Whiskey, um, or John Werfgum, sorry. He's saying the whiskey boom has a long way to go. Craft beer is still booming, and I believe whiskey will follow the same path. Yes, but beer is flat, and in fact, beer is shrinking. What's happening is the value of beer is going up, but the volume is going down. So people are moving to craft beer, very, very parallel lines with what we've been talking about in whiskey, absolutely. Uh, Prestige Liquids is saying, I think like anything with any fad, you'll always have your ups and downs. Having said that, those of us who are very passionate about whiskey will stay for life, absolutely. And when the, the, the downs do come again, a lot of the whiskey will perhaps become more affordable, who knows? Uh, Brent Ross, hi Brent, good to see you. And he's saying, do you think it will be like cigars? The demand has dropped, but prices stayed inflated after the boom. Yeah, but that's that's more to do with um, the you know the scale of production and things like that, right? So I'm not an expert on cigars. I don't really know what happened there, um, but I don't I don't. Yeah, I wouldn't know how to to handle that one. I would suggest that right now we're in a, a very good now time to enjoy whiskey. It's never ever been as good as it is right now. Yes, the prices are getting more expensive. Yes, we're having to track down those special editions and fight for some of them. But really, what's the alternative that they just don't exist? Because they do exist now and and we're all enjoying it and we're all getting together and enjoying it in a very, very shared way. It's fantastic. Uh, Arbaggi is saying, um, uh, uh, no, I, got, I picked up Arbaggi's question. Fantastic. Daniel Vermas from Hungary is saying, how to, a question for Scott, how to deal with cask shortage I mean, the lack of availability of good 
casks. We'll come back to that, Scott, because the dram that we're going to have after this Aaron is your cask strength, bourbon and sherry cask. Perfect. We can talk about casks then and pick up Daniel's question, I hope. Uh, Stephen Reynolds is saying, do we ever think we will see the 40% on a lot of the bigger brands increase up to 43, 46, 48, etc.? Very good question, Stephen, and I think we can tackle that with the next subject. Um, and so many of the, the questions, like I say, if, you, if I don't get around to tackling them with Scott tonight, please leave them in the comments and we'll get back to them. So two things there. I love talking about casks and wood. That's probably because it's the area the area that I would consider I'm, I'm one of the areas in whiskey that I'm quite weak in. And the other question there, um, and I think it's a good thing to talk about now, we're sitting here joining, albeit very, very different ABVs, but cask strength ABVs in this uh, Aaron edition of the Bothy on the back of enjoying a 43% um, legacy. Scott, why is there a difference? Why does Tomatin choose to put things out at 43% and then have a massive amount of the range catered um, with very, very nice ABVs, age statements, as much information on the bottle, and then other ones are, are sitting like this legacy. There's not really much information on this bottle. I'm actually surprised that it even says bourbon and virgin oak casks. Can you give us a resume, a, a quick synopsis? I can do. So the legacy that we had there, um, you, you mentioned earlier on absolutely correctly, in America it is Dualcus. Um, and the liquid in that bottle ranges from four to about seven years old, 85% matured in bourbon barrels, first fill bourbon barrels, and that's the older stock, and then 15% matured in virgin North American oak, and that's the younger stock. Virgin oak can be quite spicy, quite full bodied, and if you leave it too long, it can overpower a whiskey. So we've got it at that 85-15 ratio with the younger stuff being from virgin oak. Now to go back to what you were talking about, strength. So the Tomatin range is designed in such a way, not just when it comes to strength and presentation, but also in the flavor profile, to be a, whisk, a, a whiskey brand that offers something for everybody. You know, Tomatin is a very versatile new mix spirit, so we fill it into a wide variety of different casks so that throughout the core range alone, you've got bourbon, virgin oak, sherry, port, all being used there and all used in different ways and different ratios so that there's something that if you come up to me at a whiskey show and say, well, I don't like your 12 year old, I can turn around and go, right, that's OK. What would you prefer, what would you like more of? And I can get that for you. And strength comes into that as well. You know. Each whiskey in our range has a different job to do. And our range is very much designed with the idea in mind that for every person like me who wants to try a tomato cask strength or a limited edition Moscatel finish, there are another hundred people out there that want to pick up a bottle at £25 from the shelf and enjoy a dram, you know. Um, and it's the commercial reality of whiskey right now. I mean, if we didn't have a legacy in 12 year old bottled at 43% and I'll be very open with you, the legacy in 12 year old, the 43%, they are chill filtered and we, we maintain the right to add a drop of coloring when it's needed. Now we're not coloring these to the gills so that they, they glow uh, like a lighthouse in the middle of the night. That's not what we're doing. We're not making them darker so you think they're older. The only reason we're adding color is because with the casks we're using, there's vast differences in color. And what we have to do is make sure that the flavor is consistent. But sometimes that means that the color of the liquid will vary. So we'll occasionally top it up. I would say for every 10 bottlings of Legacy we do, maybe five times we add color to it. And it's a tiny, tiny amount. I actually got the figure through the other day from the bottling hall as to what percentage of the actual um, mix it is and i can't remember off the top of my head i think it was 0.02 percent of the vat is coloring I'll, I'll put that into the the comments below um but to, to go back to what i'm saying there these whiskies are made like that because of the fact that for the vast majority of people drinking whiskey strength is still the main barrier to entry so we have to be uh able to give them a whiskey. And for us to be able to produce limited editions that are matured in Moscatel casks, to uh, make 
the Tomat and Quattro series to bottle uh, 1972 single casks. For us to be able to do that, there has to be a commercial product in there as well. And for us, that's a legacy in 12 year old. There are two biggest selling single malts globally. Um, and they allow us to do the things that guys like us think are fun and are intriguing. Now that doesn't mean we should overlook these products because as, as you said there, the legacy is still hands down one of the best value for money whiskies available for a drinking whisky. And I, I've hoped, I hope that's answered that question. That's it has, and I, and I think what you're saying is that and it's, a, it's a challenge that the industry has, you know, that the vast majority of even people that are exploring whiskey in, from, in a single malt category, if they're going to a retailer, if they're going to a supermarket or whatever, they're standing there the concepts of chill filtration and colouring and things like that don't dawn on them. And I think it's a difficult thing, firstly, to, to encourage them to go higher than 43% ABV. Their palate isn't ready for it. But also the concept that, you know, they, they, they don't... There's a price point thing, obviously, as you've mentioned, it's driven by price. But they wouldn't be open, I think. And I think about myself at the start of my whiskey journey. They wouldn't be open to seeing two bottles potentially side by side branded the exact same and clearly being two different colors one or both could be rejected i, I imagine that that's an issue that you're constantly grappling with right yeah i mean there there's definitely been times where we've and we experienced this quite a lot in the early days of our 14 year olds because we were using port casks for the first time and um from the first batch that we released to the second batch, there was a massive difference in color and in clarity as well, um, because it's a non-chill filtered product. And we did get a lot of feedback from the market that this was an issue, you know? So it's, it's I think there's a tendency for people that enjoy their whiskey and want to see everything naturally presented to, to maybe overlook that and um, to, not to nullify it or negate it, but not to consider it as such an important issue as it is, you know, um, because it really does influence the um, a massive amount of buyers in the market. Understand, understand. So I hope that went some way towards um, uh, answering the, the question there. But I mean, it's one of these subjects, honestly, that you could just talk about and talk about um, for a long, long time, and so much of it does come down to educating the mm -hmm. consumer, um, much in the same way that craft beer does or, or any kind of wine appreciation or anything like that. And I guess that as a community, that's kind of what we're doing. We're doing it uh, through social media channels, we're doing it through our clubs, we're doing it over our own dining tables and, and doing our own wee tastings and things like that, just to talk about these things. But I think it's always important to understand why these things exist and the exactly. fact that you know the only reason that Scotch whiskey has been successful at all is that sometime in the late 19th century, a grocer was able to make a blended product so consistently that he could put a brand on it. Yeah, I mean, I think an interesting thing as well is, like you say, it's absolutely important to be aware of these issues, but I don't think it's as easy as saying chill filtration, bad, uh, non coloring good you know it's not it's not that black and white but what i think is interesting is and it's sometimes overlooked a wee bit is if you look at the state of the whiskey industry right now and i did a little uh, look online today i always use the whiskey exchange as a good sort of um way of analyzing what's going on in terms of what's available yeah. and i went in there i went to single malt scotch whiskey i went to standard bottles and there are more uh, single malt whiskies available at 46% and above than there are at below 46%. And this is an amazing thing because this has only really happened in the last five, maybe 10 years. But I think what's interesting is the, the reason that we're getting more of these products is the exact same reason we had whiskey at 40% with coloring, with chill filtering, and it is namely demand. You know, the demand in the past was for consistency, consistency of flavor, of presentation, of um, profile. Now there's more and more demand for nuance, for change, for uh, higher strength, for natural presentation. And to say that the industry is not responding is absolutely false. You know, if you, you sure. just look at and the, I, and I think, I think it's a point I made very recently in the last two streams 
um, certainly in one of the last streams that that we've never enjoyed. We're constantly going on about as whiskey appreciators. We've never enjoyed a time that we've had as many whiskies presented naturally um, with no no colour added ad written on the label, uh, non-chill filtered or unchill filtered written on the label, the ABVs where they want them to be, information about the age, and and even when they, they're non-age statements, like the, the idea of the, the batch released cast strength things, it's very, very easy to find out what the ages of the makeup of the whiskey are if you're so inclined. Yeah. Um, but I want to throw this out to you, and I appreciate that this might be awkward. Do you think it's easy to employ these um, these processes that we have in place, such as the addition of colour and things, in a cynical way? Absolutely. I mean, th there can be no denying that there are still a handful of brands on the market, and I'm not going to name names, but I'm sure many of you have come across them, that are very clearly using colouring, um, colouring specifically, you know, chill filtering and non-chill filtering, it's either a yes or a no. Um, age statement, non-age statement, it tends to be more stock driven than a decision that's made. Um, but I think colouring for me is the big one there, that it is something that can either be used to, uh, to be, well, first of all, you don't have to use it. Secondly, you can decide to use it for consistency purposes, or the more cynical side is, you can color a three-year-old whiskey as dark as you want, and it will look like something that's been in a sherry cask for 20 years. Now, that's something that I can't abide by, you know. Um, I would I love, love, I would never do this to you, but I would love to ask you to tell us, in your opinion, which producers are doing that. But I think that's a power of community. Yeah. And I'm sorry to interrupt you there, Scott. I'm very glad the way you answered the question. But honestly, I think it's the power of community to get together and understand when we are seeing these very, very contrived expressions, um, because they they are partly at fault. If the industry wants to educate educate us and we and stands up and says, do you know what? For the majority of our market, the price point that we are selling this whiskey at, at the market demands that they see the same product every time they buy a bottle. Mm -hmm. We can understand in this in the the. Tomatin 12 year old, Lagavulin 16, these kind of whiskies, that's the buyer for these kind of whiskies in the majority of cases. We understand the need for consistency there. However, what's really getting whiskey enthusiasts frustrate, frustrated is when it is put to you cynically. And we are, we're presented with this delicious, enticing, dark bottle of whiskey. Mm -hmm. And then you just pause for a while with it to understand, wait a minute, this price point, or uh, what's worse is that sometimes the price point can be inflated as well. But you start to look at how it's presented, you start to look at how it's positioned from a marketing perspective, and you understand fairly early in your whiskey journey, if you're fortunate, that these are whiskies not to engage with. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a couple of brands that I think the most disappointing thing is that they are more expensive than the average non-chill filtered whiskey, you know? and and, and non-coloured whiskey. But the thing that really annoys me is that when you've got a brand that does this and then you go on tour and the person pouring the whiskey says, and you just have to look at the colour of the whiskey, you know, that's pulling away so much fact and so much information from the what needs to be talked about, you know. Um, now, like I say, I'm not going to name brands. Um, that's, that's not what we're here to do, not to name and shame, but be aware that that does still go on. You know, there are brands out there that are, and I, I tend to see it more with blends now than single malt. You know, I think single malt as a whole has responded to consumer demand for authenticity. You know, that's what single malt is. It's an authentic craft driven product. Even the biggest single malt distilleries in Scotland right now, there can be no doubt that what they're doing is a craft. So I, I certainly see it more on the blended side where mass consistency is required. But um, I do th I do think there is a move away from the more sinister employment of these practices, but it's still out there. Um, I think, I as think the more informed that we become as consumers, the more they have to respond. Yeah. Because it will become a time that uh, most people will understand, just the same as they understood some of the more cynical practices in wine presentation, yeah. they will start to understand some of the more uh, cynical practices in whiskey. And I think that um, 
Um, I, I think it's interesting to hear, and information is king here. And, uh, and I think people as well, don't want to have to spend their money twice, right? Yeah, I think the point I would make as well is these brands are still doing very, very well. So they're not going to change just because we moan or because we talk about it and say it's a bad thing. What will uh, what will drive this change to work towards more natural presentation is when the brands that are presenting their product naturally are their their sales are elevated. So it's absolutely a case of we need to be telling more people and educating more people. It's it's my job to do it, but I think as whiskey consumers, you do yourself a favor by educating people that don't know about these issues about them, um, because then you see more sales of the products that are a bit more natural. Um, again, don't overlook things that aren't that don't take all of your A B C D things, because there's still some incredible whiskey drinking experiences to be had that maybe don't score so well on that scale. But make sure that everybody's aware of these issues and of these practices. I think that yeah, would be... I mean, it's even difficult for me. I'm very much responsible for everything that I share on this channel and talk about. They're my words, they're my opinions and things. But if I talk about these ABCDs and then, then the very next breath, I'm recommending a product that doesn't meet these ABCDs. To somebody coming into whiskey, that can be a difficult thing to... to to, to discuss and to explain. But I always say that, you know, what these ABCDs do is they don't tell you that the quality of the whiskey experience, but they will give you a good idea what the intended market for mm -hmm. those whiskies were. That's always the suggestion. But please don't insist on it because so many of the whiskies that remain among my favorite whiskies don't necessarily meet those four things. Absolutely. Listen, guys, if you are appreciating the uh, candor from Scott, um, the qu the questions that he's taken and things. Um, give us a little thumbs up, give us a, a like to the video and um, leave your comments down below after the, 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 the fact. And Scott and myself will both answer the questions in the comments after. I'm going to ask Scott one of the most difficult questions he's probably ever been asked live. Are you ready, Scott? Let's go, let's go. Will you stay? and participate in the Aqua Vitae quiz at the end? I will absolutely participate, but I don't know if I'll tell you what score I get. <laughs> that remains to be seen. Okay. Okay, fantastic. Let's see if we can grab another couple of questions from the crowd just before we, we start to move on. What time are we looking at? Um, we're doing not bad. We're at about an hour and seven minutes in, Scott. So we're doing okay for time. Very much enjoying the chat. Thank you very much for joining me once again. Jeremy Sims is saying, um, that is about the only reason to use colour. And I love that you added that it wasn't added to make it appear older like some others, um, which is something that Jeremy has personal issue with. I think that's the points we discussed. Absolutely. Uh, McAllen Fine Rare the Doc is saying that that ratio seems to be true for other distilleries. Remember that um, the distillery manager of Lefroy said 70% of their output is the 10 year old. That's true. We tend to forget that with our cast strength obsession. That's right. And the, the space that we're occupying and join whiskey is really, really passionate and formed community. Um, by far, the bulk of this whiskey has been sold to people that just like having a nice, tasty bottle of whiskey at home. And uh, they don't really have the time or inclination to engage um, at, the, at the level of informed um, uh, you know, dialogue that, that, that we participate in. Absolutely, Doc, that's exactly our, our point here. Um, Everwind is saying, I, Aquaviti, I do have a serious question. Um, uh, are the whiskey tubers like Ralphie and others, Scotch for Dummies, Scotch Test Dummies, influencing the distilleries? Well, I guess both of us could answer that question, Scott, but I would suggest that um, we're only influencing the distillery and as much as the community at a whole is as a movement, as 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 playing a role and and kind of being a voice there. Um, I would say that Ralphie's at the scale now that he can have direct influence on the fortunes of certain expressions. And maybe, maybe you could argue some distilleries now with the size of the channel that he has. But that's an interesting uh, question to put to Scott, something that, that you and I have never discussed, Scott. Is that happening? I guess not just on YouTube, but um, you know, from uh, commentators out there, are they influencing the direction of the industry? I think th they certainly are in terms of the newer distilleries and the craft distilleries. I would have absolutely no doubt 
that distilleries that are designing, that, that exist to fuel the demand of people like us, absolutely are taking on board the discussion that's been had tonight. I think one thing we have to bear, bear in mind is that the smallest um, group of consumers in any category is very often the loudest. You know, so there is a silent majority that we also have to pay attention to. So, you know, um, a company that I previously worked at had this um, analogy that you can describe any consumer category in the one, nine and 90 percentile. So 90 percent of people are picking up a bottle of whiskey in a supermarket and they're taking it to the checkout. Nine percent of people are exploring a little bit more but they're still not fully savvy. And then there's 1%, and that's where we are all are. Everybody in this chat tonight is in that 1% that are fully engaged and fully embraced in the discussion. But I think for a big, massive company or a big brand who is distributed globally to design their whole range based on the discussion that that 1% is having, quite simply, it would be foolish. Now, we definitely, uh, from the Tamatan point of view, we definitely take it on board. It's the reason that we create the limited releases that we do. But it's not going to stop us from having Legacy as our introductory product. It's not going to stop us from having the 12-year-old at 43%. But it is definitely going to, uh, these are the people that we listen to when we're talking about our Five Virtues series, when we're talking about things like the Tamatan Decades that we did in 2011. Um, so I think YouTubers end up giving us more limited releases and single casks and things like that. And I think that can only be a positive thing. But I think what's more important, uh, the role of the YouTube community is not to influence the distillery, but it's to bring more casual consumers to the point of having that discussion. Excellent. Uh, look, I'll just mention quickly before I, I, I answer a question, a question from Malt Content, um, talking about Alistair much again, and uh, we spoke about this last night and after we chatted I realised that perhaps um, the soundbite I gave you was at least 50% me putting words in Alistair's mouth, but it was it was nevertheless, uh, nonetheless a very, very um, moment of clarity for me yeah. and Alistair's um, honesty when, when I posed the question to him directly afterwards, I said, you know, we talked about this very thing, how much of the scale of production goes towards a 12 year old, goes towards the legacy, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, and he, he he openly talked about it. And then he talked about Tomatin's history and what they've been doing in the past in terms of contract fillings and things. So what would we prefer as a community? Would we prefer that Tomatin were back in the days of making as much product as efficiently as possible to fill contracts? Or would we prefer that they made the best representation of their distillery at the best price point that they could, they could achieve? If they went for that balance, what would we prefer? And I know what I would accept, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the way you worded that is perfect. You know, it's, it very much goes back to the idea that if we want these, I mean, I truly believe, I, I, I say it from the point of view as a brand ambassador, but also from the whiskey drinker point of view, I truly believe that some of the casks I've tasted in the warehouses in Taman are up there with the best whiskies that you will ever try in your life. But in order for us to get to the point of releasing that, we have to have a commercial side as well. Now, we either have the choice of having commercially available single malts like Legacy and 12-year-old um, that maybe some people in this chat will shy away from because they they don't tick all the boxes. I, I think you're missing out on something. Like you said, it's the perfect sociable whiskey. But maybe that happens. So it's either that we have those products which allow us to do this or we go back to the days of being a big bulk supplier to to the blended Scotch whiskey industry. Absolutely. We, we, we employ I think what the, the, the point you're making there as well is that this is very optional. You don't need to buy these, regardless of how inexpensive they are to pick up these legacies or the 12-year-olds, even when they're on offer, you don't need to buy those. Yeah. But uh, Aaron, the Martin, so many other distilleries like Ben Romack and all of these out there, Ben Romack, 43% as well. But look at the presentation that those guys are bringing as well. They're very much um, able to cater for a product that they can put out at a reasonable price, but they can also give us a decent selection of product based on that business model that gives us variation, that gives us 
um, uh, experimentation um, that brings the quality, brings the age statement, brings the cast strength stuff. Absolutely. Malt Content has got a fantastic question. Malt Content, thank you so much for your virtual dram as well. Um, I'll read out his question. He's saying, cheers, Roy. Can you ask Scott, um, what is your favourite cheapo blend? Never write them off. The taste of teachers got me into whiskey. Yeah. Great question, Malt Content. What would you say? Have you got a... Are you carrying a torch somewhere for a, a blend that you enjoy? I absolutely am. And, um, my go-to, I always call it my pub whiskey, you know, because it's very rare that I have a cheap old blend in the house, if you want to call it that. I've always got a bottle of White and Mackay 13-year-old, but that's not necessarily a cheap old blend. My go-to pub whiskey is Black Bottle. Um, I don't know what it is about it. There's just a little soft spot that it has for me that if it's on the back bar on the gantry, I'll be having a dram of that. Fantastic. You you stole the um, the easy answer is is to suggest. I mean, in the past, it would be nice to say things like Bailey Nickel Jarvie and things as well, but they're not unfortunately they're not available anymore. But Black Bottle, um, a lot over time, there's been significant variation in how that's presented. Absolutely, but it's a it's a decent blend that it's very easy to oh. just sit and sip. And if you're in a pub environment where it's more about the chat. You're not in whiskey company. You're just in, you know, your regular friends and family. Black Bottle, if that's what they have behind the bar, it's one that you can sip quite easily, right? So it's an interesting thing as well with the job that I do. That What you do notice is that when you leave Scotland and you look at hotel bars or your average pub around the world, they're getting better with their whiskey selection, but there's still very much a core uh, selection available. So if I'm traveling and I land and I go to a hotel and I've checked my bags in and I go down to the bar, nine times out of 10, I'm having a little dram of Johnny Walker Black Label, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that whiskey at all. It is a very, very, it, for that moment in the hotel when you've just got off the flight, that's a brilliant whiskey. And then I think the depths of stock that Diageo have at their disposal means that they're able to provide a very consistent profile there yeah. and quality as well, absolutely. Um, let's jump into the chat quickly. And I think that we should get on with pouring our last dram of the night, right? Um, Perfect. Perfect. I think it's a nice kind of uh, stable mate almost, albeit a different casking, to the Aaron Bothy. You've, it's a Tomatin product this time, right? That's right, yeah. So we're going back to Tomatin now. And we're going to try the tomato cask strength. So it's actually, in terms of its aging, very, very similar to, to what we've just had with the Bothy. This is nine years old. Doesn't say it on the label. It's a non-age dated product. It's nine years old. And this isn't a batch release. This is part of our core range. Um, so it sits in between the 12-year-old and 14-year-old in terms of pricing. Nine years old, 50% fully matured in first fill bourbon barrels. 50% fully matured and first full sherry casks. So it's going to add that element that we didn't have in there. And there maybe a, a perfect way to round off the evening with that depth to it. Uh, and then we bottle that at 57.5% ABV. And this and, and you're always bottling at 57.5, right? That's right. So I tell you what then, Scott, uh, permit me to uh, try and relax with the chat just for a little bit. And I'll try and do a bit of an uncorking here. I don't really... Um, Uncorkings are obviously, we have the frustration with them that it's difficult to judge a whiskey on the, the first pour, right? Yeah. But it's still, there's a bit of a ceremony about it and I quite enjoy it. I like that idea of, um, especially when it's one like this one that you've never tried before. I don't have any uh, recollection of having tried this whiskey before, um, which is why I was drawn to it when I was in the other day. Before Sorry. you do that, and it's something that I, I always suggest to people to add a wee drop of water to their whiskey if they want to, of course. But I think what I've learned more in time when it comes to tomatin is that anything from tomatin that is unchill filtered, before you add water, leave it for 10 minutes in the glass. Because tomatin is a whiskey that truly does develop just by sitting and taking in the environment, uh, more so than it does with water. Uh, and some of our drams where we've done a finish, I find like our 14 year old, for example, if you add a drop of water, it takes something away from the whiskey. But time is massively influential on a tomato dram. So I'll just tell you that before you. Okay, well, let's have a wee go then. What we'll do is I'll sip water then and I'll pour this. Lovely noise. 
I'll pour this and let it sit for a little while as I grab some people from the chat and that'll let you relax for a second, Scott, and uh, enjoy the same. 57.5%. That's right. Oh, wow, that's, uh, that's a surprise. So you know the notes that I was talking about in the legacy, the, the kind of fresh pineapple and things? Mm -hmm. That's all there. The, this is very fruity. <laughs> Surprised how fruity that is. Okay, let's see. Everwind is saying it seems like a Ralphie review of 89 plus will cause a run on the product and a bad review can hurt. No, potentially. Again, the, the amount of. Um, so if you imagine a scenario like uh, last year, Ralphie said his whiskey of the year was Glencadam 15. Um, suddenly you couldn't buy Glencadam 15 anywhere. And I haven't even seen that whiskey, that expression pop its head up since. So yeah, on an individual expression, um, things like that can have that effect now, given the scale um, of uh, subscribership that Ralphie is commanding now. Perhaps that's happening in the States, Everwind, way over where you are, I don't know, but certainly it's probably true of things like that, events like that happening in the UK. But again, these are all optional things for us. There are so many whiskies out there, there are so many expressions that we don't really, I know it's a very human condition thing that we all want to get that whiskey, right? But we don't need to, we're absolutely spoilt for choice right now. And if we miss out on a whiskey, especially if you're in a community and you have friends, there's a good chance that a friend is going to get it or has got it and you can share it that way. So there's no need, as I talked about in a, a, a live stream fairly recently, there's no need to always chase whiskey. Kilted Moose Scott is saying he, he's, he has a bottle of Tomatins Anticurry 35. Scott, you've shared that with me. It was delicious. He said, that's exactly what I was talking about just there. So there's no way that I would necessarily find or happen upon a bottle of Antiquary 35, but Scott has that. And I actually think I sipped that on a live stream. He gave me a nice generous sample of that and it was delicious. And he's asking any plans for further older releases in the future. Um, so I guess that's down to you because that's a blend that you handle, uh, Scott, right? That's right, yeah. Um, so the Antiquary range at the moment is a non-edge statement, a 12 year old, a 21 year old, and we did a 35 year old limited release bottling, but this is something that is um, is quite interesting. You know, that 35 year old blended antiquary, it was a cask of Tomatin 35 year old and a cask of Gervin 35 year old. And you can put that in a blind tasting with any single malt in the world. And I would say 99 times out of 100, it's going to come out pretty close to the top. But because it carries that word blend, it was amazing how long it took that to permeate through into the market. Um, and I, I had conversations with a, people at a festival and when I told them it was a blend, they made the decision not to buy it, which is maddening to me. But um, yes, is the simple answer. Um, we will always try and put out the best whiskey we have available. And we have some stunning, stunning age stocks of blend. Um, sitting right now in our warehouse uh, that will eventually see the light of day because we're not pouring them down a drain, that's for sure. Fantastic. Aviation Pro is saying, um, uh, Band of Brothers, my favorite series, got me into looking up VAT69. Wow. And then found Ralphie, then found Aquavite and others. Haha, <laughs> that's kind of funny. So I've got Band of Brothers to thank for your um, subscribership, Aviation Pro. That's fantastic. It's a cool story. Colorless Blue Things is saying he's constantly shouting this to whoever will listen and keep doing so. Best blend I've had for the money, Jameson's Crested. Interesting. I think I, I'm pretty much guarantee I've tried that, but I don't have much recollection of it. So there you go, Jameson Crested, according to Colourless Blue Things, one to watch out for. Whiskey Throttle Daniel is asking another one for Scott, saying, any new Kuboken planned? Yeah, so the last new Kuboken that you would have seen was the 1990 uh, vintage that we just released a couple of months ago. Um, it's a non-peated 1990 tomato that's been finished in uh, ex Isla casks. Not allowed to name the distillery, but um, I'm sure there's not that many distilleries out there. So really, really lovely, lovely whiskey. And we've got a, a few plans in the pipeline. I'm currently working on some uh, recipes right now for uh, what we're doing with Kubok next year. And it's very exciting, very exciting. It's going to, it's going to be something that you've maybe not seen from Kubok before. 
I'll be honest with you, because you were on tonight, and I wasn't sure whether you'd be participating in the quiz or not, um, but on the idea that you weren't, there, there are a couple of, um, let's say, tomato friendly questions slotted into the quiz, but I chose not to put one of the questions in there, um, uh, and I, I was going to keep it for another quiz. But it's interesting that Tomatin have been making peated whiskey from, I think, 2005. Mm -hmm. And yet you're able to put out a 1988 vintage Kuboka yeah. peated, a 1989, a 1990. Now, you've just explained. I've explained two of them. Sorry? Because, so what happened, uh, this, this is a brilliant story of just how the whiskey industry works. And this how is what I was hoping I could get you to share. I, I yeah. know this story, but I wanted to hear it from the horse's mouth. Yeah, it's just how charming the whiskey industry can be. You know, we released Kubokin in 2013 from the liquid that we had been making since 2005. So the standard Kubokin is always an eight year old, you know, and we released the Kubokin into the market. And then I want to say in about February in 2014, our production manager at the time, uh, Charlie Edward, came over to our sales office. Now, Tomatin as a company has grown massively in the last few years. But at this time, there was myself, another sales manager, a sales director and a marketing manager. You know, that, that was who was looking after Tomatin globally. And Charlie came over with three samples with just 1989 uh, scribbled on a piece of paper on them. And uh, we tried them and like, oh wow, that's that's pretty incredible stuff. What distillery is that from? And he said, oh no, that's that's ours. Like, Charlie, um, how much have you had today? You know, this is very pronounced smoky whiskey. So we're very fortunate as well. One of the aspects of having the housing on site is that a lot of people work at the distillery for a very, very long time. And we got in contact with our head mashman, Martin Henry, and he and I asked him pretty much what, what are we looking at here? And he very much told us that this was a batch of peated barley that arrived in the late 1980s, where although we'd come out of the liquidation period, we were still producing quite hard. You know, we were, we were still a quantity driven distillery. And um, the, th the, the thought of going to the uh, distillery manager at that time and saying, we're going to lose a week's production because some peated barley has accidentally arrived at the distillery and we need to turn it away. That just wasn't considered back then. You know, the, the importance of the new make spirit, um, holy grail character didn't exist in the same way that it does now. So yeah. their thought was very much, let's produce it and it'll be blended. And they were right, the vast majority of that load of barley was blended away. But in 2014, we had the last three casks of that, which allowed us to bottle 1,030 bottles of a 1989 Kubokin, which was genuinely peated barley that arrived at Tomatin. It was stunning, stunning liquid. And there was a very much a demand for that. And the only way we can replicate that older Kubokins is by having non-peated tomatin matured in ex isla casks. And it is truly amazing the influence that they have. We actually, if you look at the way we distill and the, if you come to the distillery and see the stills and where we take our cut of the run, it is absolutely at odds with making a peated whiskey. You know, last year we used barley peated to about 38 ppm. And when we tasted the new mixed spirit, we're surprised at how little of that had actually come through. Now, that's what the that is what Kubokin is. It's a lightly peated whiskey. But to use these Isla casks just elevates that smoke that it gives us a medicinal character that we don't have being a distillery that's 315 meters above sea level. It adds a salinity that we don't get in our Highland warehouses. So it's it's fascinating stuff. That and that would be the 1988 and the 1990 that we just released. So that's interesting. You've you've uh, you've now um, narrowed down your Isla Distillery casks to three on the southern coast, <laughs> <laughs> just by virtue of the age. Yes, well, by virtue of um, and perhaps your description of the salinity and things mm. as well. Um, yeah. And you would I, be I correct give by a... uh, going to those three. I'm sorry. I'm saying you would be correct with those three, but I'm not going to name which one. Don't worry, don't worry. There's, I, I think <laughs> most of us have already narrowed it down. Um, 
Uh, I'd just like to shout out to Diojo. I think his surname is Flores. Diojo has dropped in just asking me how I am, and he said it was great to meet you in Frankfurt. It was, Diojo, it was great to meet you too. Diojo met me in Frankfurt. He came up and he asked, he said, uh, you look a lot like Aquavite from the Aquavite channel. Um, <laughs> and it's my, I believe it's the first time I was asked to sign my autograph, which is an absolutely crazy thing. Whiskey can do crazy, crazy things. So let me ask Scott, have we um, have we let this sit for long enough, or do you think a wee bit longer? Yeah, no, I think we're there about, about, I've, been, um, I've been sipping a, few, a, a wee bit, and I think it's, it's peak. I think, I think honestly now, um, and I didn't get this when I first poured it. It was lots of fresh fruit, like I, like I suggested, but now I'm getting things that are more aligned with sherry casks. There's a nuttiness here, yeah. um, and you there's there's a uh, a light spice, maybe a, I always find it difficult to isolate a spice, but like a cinnamon note to it. It's exactly what I get with this. It's, it's got that little bit of going into a garden centre at Christmas time, that cinnamony, gingery, um, spiced apple sort of thing. Nice. Uh, actually, actually now, yeah, I had that, but also almost like a, like a mulled wine thing. So yeah. I think it's that that kind of citrusy, fruity thing happening. And then that nice spice. So I imagine, yeah. you know, around about this time of year that people have got these little pans of, of mulled wine happening. Um, it's kind of it's kind of a wee bit reminiscent of that. And a wee bit a wee bit woody, like a sandalwoody thing or a or a like a cedarwood type thing, that kind of thing. I don't you get a kind of woody note there. Yeah, definitely. And I think the thing that I always find with any tomatin, if you come to a tomatin tasting and you want to show off, just say malty and orange peel. And and you're absolutely right every time. And this has got that in by the bucket load, I think. Fantastic. I'm going to try a little sip neat just before I, I put a wee drop of water in it. Okay, no, okay, the malt is there, my goodness, it's the, um, lots of heat, lots of spice. There's, the, the malt is, is it's really reminiscent of, if, you, if you've ever been in um, any distillery, there's a very, very strong malt smell that you get. You'd literally breathe it in at certain parts of the tour, right? Yeah. And that, that heavy malt is there. Very, very spicy on the finish, lots of spice. High, obviously, the high ABV is carrying a lot of spice as well. A lot of the, um, the orange, definitely buy that. In fact, I'll go as far to say that, especially now, it's 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 rind. It's the it's the bitter orange rind I've got in the finish. Wow! Can you tell me as well what is this that we have on the top? Yeah, so that's uh, the hogshead. Um, so. This has been a part of the Tomatin branding for longer than we actually knew the reason for it. So this is, so the history of Tomatin is that it's always been massively tied up with the blended Scotch whiskey industry. But what that masks is that there's been a single malt Tomatin available since the mid 1950s. You know, we were very much one of the first distilleries to have a single malt available. Um, not marketed, not heavily marketed, but available. And in around about the 1970s, they started using this wider logo here um, with the two lions and the hog's head in the middle. And the hog's head's very much become the focus of that because historically the hog's head represented Highland hospitality. At the end of a successful clan hunt or something like that, there would be a celebration surrounding the hog's head and that would be part of the feast. So it is very much that. Tomatin's a friendly, no-nonsense distillery. We speak to customers like they're friends, and it is that welcome to Tomatin. So it's nothing to do with a hog's head being um, a remade cask then? Potentially. You know, potentially that's where they came from. I mean, I guess at the Highland Feast it would have been a boar's head, right? Um, but we've just always called it the hog's head, and I guess that's because of the Whiskey Association. So... If you come to Tomatin, we've got a tasting bar 
where you can buy tokens and buy drams of rare and exclusive tomato and whiskies, and it's called the Hogshead Bar and things like that. So um, it's definitely a, a, a core part of our, our brand and what we've done as a producer for a long time. Fantastic. Fantastic. So let me just uh, do a couple of quick housekeeping things, and then I'm going to um, invite a Scott to stay for the quiz at the end. Um, there is, uh, I'm sure the Scotch Four Dummies are going to be going out live in the middle of the night tonight. Um, so you can tune into those guys. I know it's the first live since they went and had their adventure in New York. They're going to have lots of cool things to share, I'm sure. I'd also like to say thanks to my friend Paul Gibbs. I was looking out for him tonight. I don't know if you're in, Paul, if I've missed him, but I got a fantastic little selection through the post from one of my favourite distilleries, Dil Ewan. Um, he's obviously uh, managed to get his hands on a few expressions of Dil Ewan and decided to share them with me, and he was nice enough to share and send enough up for the Whiskey Rev as well. I'm hoping that the Whiskey Rev and I can get together over Christmas or New Year at some point and share all of these whiskies that's coming in for us to share. Um, I think we're going to need more days, Rev, if I'm honest. And also, I've got this. This is a sample set sent to me by Scott, who's in tonight. He sent me this in summertime um, because uh, I was carrying this, uh, these across to, to Scotch Test Dummies for a collaboration that they were doing. And as a thank you for uh, being a whiskey mule, basically, um, I get given these. So I'm hoping to share these with the Whiskey Rev as well um, over Christmas. So thanks, Paul. I hope you're in tonight. Um, if we're ready for the quiz, uh, I was looking for Jason is in. We are just about ready to um, crank the quiz up and get it started. It's uh, 20 past 11. I would love to rush through this quiz quickly and try and get finished before two hours. The reason for that is that if you go over two hours on YouTube on a live stream, the rendering takes a bit longer. So if you come in to watch the live stream immediately after it's just gone out, you, you're only able to watch the last two hours and there's no live chat appears alongside with it as well. It's a wee bit frustrating. So if I can keep that under two hours, I dodge that technical issue, I believe. Um, so yeah, it would be good if we could get the quiz underway. Thank you so much to Amy, to um, everybody who was Paul Gibbs is in, fantastic. Thank you very, very much, Paul. Good to see your name pop up there. It's, it's fantastic for everybody that's hit the likes. We've managed to creep over 100 likes again, and I thank you very, very graciously for, for all of your participation. Like I said, please save the questions that we, I, weren't, I was not able to get to tonight. Put them in the comments of the video, not in the live chat, of course, but in the comments of the video. And I will bully Scott until he goes in, he signs in and replies to your questions um, that we weren't able to handle tonight. But there were so many questions come in and I thank you all for your participation. Um, and uh, I've very much enjoyed hanging out with Scott tonight and hearing what he has to say. Um, I have the impression, Scott, that um, there simply wouldn't be enough hours in any event that we could put together for you and I to sit around the table and get through all the topics that we could discuss, right? Yeah, it could go on a while. It could go on for a long, long time, I Does think. Does it ever become tiresome for you working in the industry? Do you ever just get a little bit whiskied out? I, I don't get whiskied out. I, sometimes I get sick and tired of hearing my own voice. You know, if, you, if you're going into, take for example, a trip I did recently, I was in Russia and I was visiting six accounts during the day, speaking to store managers and then going and doing a tasting at night. And you're telling the same story. And it's a story I find fascinating. But at times I, I'm standing doing a, a tasting and I'm thinking, have I told these people this already? Because I've said it so much during the day. But I never, never tire of sharing a dram with new people and uh, talking to them about tomato and whiskey in general. So, no, I, I thank you very much for having me on and allowing me to do that on my Thursday night. Fantastic. Great. So, strap in, Scott. Um, I'm, I don't know. I think you're familiar with the quiz, that you keep your own score. Yeah. Um, you can you can admit to getting things right or wrong, or you can choose to play it cool and just let us know um, halfway through point and then near the end how your scores are getting on. But everybody keeps their own score. Um, there's no prizes, generally speaking. It's just for kudos and fun. Um, Ten questions. Tonight, it's interesting because the Whiskey Rev, if he's still here, can participate because tonight is a very rare occasion and the, the makeup of the quiz tonight doesn't have any questions donated by the Rev. There were a couple of questions that I had in the, in the, in the Whiskey Rev question bank. I removed in the hope that I could encourage him to participate. Um, but if he's not around 
Um, let me see the last time I got a message from him. He may or may not be um, available to participate. But if you are Rev, join in the quiz. Let's see how you get on. Okay, great. Jason, I'm ready to start this quiz. I'll pull up the, the screen and get things running. Okay, Scott, let's go. First question. Ah, this is an obscure one already. Harper's Weekly in 1896 noted that which distillery obtained the highest price of any single Scotch whiskey? So we're going back to the late 19th century, a distillery that's been around for a long time. And even back then, this distillery was very, very highly regarded. And obviously the, the language is interesting there that the quote actually calls it a single Scotch whiskey. This is way back before the days where it was known as a single malt. But I'm obviously referring to a single malt. Was it from A, McAllen, B, Kleinleash, or C, Glenlivet? Which distillery obtained the highest price of any single Scotch whiskey at the end of the 19th century, according to Harper's Weekly, which I imagine was an authoritative, an authoritative um, publication of its time? I imagine that there's going to be some guesswork going on at this one. If I'm honest, did I know this? I didn't. <laughs> I think the best I could have hoped for on this one would be an educated guess. What would you say, Scott? Yeah, I've, I've, it's an educated guess. Okay, I thought so much. So there's um, lots and lots of uh, uh, people that think it's C. C seems to be the very, very popular answer here. Nigel Slynn says A. Whiskey Jason also says A. So either A, McAllen or C. Um, Apu is saying he likes the idea of it being A and B. Okay, so here we go. Now, I don't know, are you actually going to write it down then so we can verify your score or are you just, am I just going to get you to verbalise your your guesses? What, what, how I've do you feel? I've got them written down. I'm starting to write them down already, but uh, I will tell you, I've gone for C. You've gone for the Glenlivet. Let's have a look. I found this amazing. But... 1896, as far back as then, Harper's Weekly noted that Klein Leash was able to command the highest price of any single Scotch whiskey. Wow. Quite amazing, right? I guess that's maybe, is that due to location? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why. It was very, very interesting. Um, I found that in uh, Charles McLean's Wikipedia, that little nugget. So. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know much about Harper's Weekly, where it actually was. Um, all three of those uh, distilleries I put up there were obviously uh, very well regarded, um, even back then. Perhaps not so much McAllen, arguably, but um, but it's interesting that Klein Leash is still very, very highly regarded by blenders even now. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on to question two. Which of the following is not a Japanese distillery? Which of the following is not a Japanese distillery? A, Fuji Gotemba. B, Miyagiko. I, I know I'm not pronouncing that right. Miyagikyo. Maybe you could pronounce that better, Scott. I don't know. Or C, Gaia Flow. Which of those three is not a Japanese distillery? Fuji Gotemba, Miyagikyo, or Gaia Flow? Christina Zarpoli is saying goose egg at the start. That's about my average. Yeah, it looks like a lot of people are going to be feeling it the same way. Um, most people went for the Glenlivet on the last one. Uh, this one, uh, Gregor is saying easy. Uh, perhaps this is a wee bit easier, but it's, it's only easy if you know, right? Lots and lots of people are saying C on this one. Only a couple are bucking the trend. Uh, Jean de la Cuisine is saying A. Malt Content is saying D. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and Diojo is saying he feels that C is a trap. Let's wait and see. Captain 3D is in, Phil and Deepa. Fantastic. Thoroughly enjoyed you guys joining on the live stream. Um, that was really, really great to have you last week. Was that a week ago already? Wow. And Hoyt is saying this seems like a trick question. Well, not really. Um, 
Which of the following is not a Japanese distillery? Gaia Flow. Gaia Flow owned the distillery Shizuka, um, but the other two, Fuji Gutemba and Miyagikyo, are distilleries. Gaia Flow own a distillery. So yes, potentially another banana skin. Or are you feeling comfortable, Scott? No, I got that one. Um, I did feel like it could have been, uh, it could have been a, a left there to trip me up. But I knew Miyagikyo. I, the other two it was a toss up, if I'm being honest. Good, good. Question three: Which distillery, once the largest malt producer in Scotland, faced liquidation in 1985? So we're talking about a distillery that was once the biggest producer in Scotland. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to help you a little bit here by suggesting that as recently as um, within a decade before it faced liquidation, it was producing back in the 70s, 12 million litres, which, okay, nowadays when we've got uh, Glenlivet and McAllen and Glenfiddich and Rose Isle and these juggernaut distilleries, that doesn't seem a lot, but back in the 70s, 12 million litres was absolutely unheard of. But then they faced liquidation in 1985. Was it A, Tomatin? Was it B, the Glenlivet? Or was it C, Glen Murray? A, Tomatin. B, the Glenlivet. Or C, Glen Murray? What do we think? Now, we obviously, we've, we have a Tomatin guy in. Would I have been that obvious? Whiskey in the Six, Rob is in. Fantastic to see you, my friend. Good to welcome you in here. Whiskey Jason from Germany is also in. Superb. Cast Strength. Vito is here. Fantastic to see all these other channels. Obviously, Alan, the whiskey friend, he's bringing out. Um, he seems to be really enjoying sharing his whiskey through YouTube right now as well. Um, picked up a couple of his videos recently. Enjoyed them very much, Alan. Good job. JW Bassman says A, Whiskey Dram A. Uh, Marku Mackinen, that looks like a, a new name. Apologies if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, Marku, but welcome in. Good to see you. Sid Martin, A, a Baggy, A. Dundee Drammer, good to welcome you in again. A, Simon Ray, A. Everybody thinking it's A. Have I been that obvious? Yes, of course. To Martin, after making 12 million litres in the 70s, uh, faced uh, the, uh, liquidation in 1985. Quite a story of recovery now, Scott, the right? Absolutely, yeah. A couple of years ago, we were uh, given the award for Scotch Distiller of the Year, so it's a, a real turn of turn of fate. Fantastic. But we've just got over this, Roy, and now you rub it in. Come on. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I think it's important to remember these things, though. It's, it's, I think it, it probably keeps the humility and the reality and the feet in the ground. And also we have to remind ourselves as whiskey fans that it wasn't always like this, that there were some seriously, seriously dark times in so many people's living memory. Now, if you were a whiskey drinker and you enjoyed whiskey, it was probably good for you because you were able to pick up fantastic stock cheaply. Yeah. And the industry went from a scenario where they were putting out an eight-year-old product, a 10-year-old product, to suddenly being able to put out 12, 15, 18, 21, and way beyond that, which was very, very rare beforehand, right? Yeah, I mean, I think the incredible thing about this sort of time and speaking to the guys, you know, we've got people that worked at Tomatin before it went into liquidation and they remember the times when they were going down to working for one day a month, you know, I mean, that's that's a, a level of hardship that we can't really even contemplate at the moment, you know. Uh, one day a month and that's obviously because they'd be living in the houses at the distillery very remotely there. Yeah. Very, very few options for them to find employment yeah. elsewhere quite incredible whiskey in the six rob has just sent me a donation across from canada thank you very much he's saying cheers mm -hmm. fight against time aren't we all at this time of year rob it's it's pretty hectic missed the fun not all of it and it's available on the replay if you do find a wee quiet moment of time pour yourself something nice and catch up on the replay rob thank you very very much my friend wonderful to have you in okay question four is uh an image a pictorial question i'm just going to bring this image up and of course, like normal, tell me, if you can, which distillery are we looking at from these three options? Now, 
Very interested to see Scott right up at the screen there studying <laughs> that. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, is this, this will help you a little bit, Scott, I hope. Is it A, Del Ewan, B, Ben Rennes, or C, Glenn Spey? I'll leave that up there as I thank uh, my friend J.W. Bassman saying another good night in the V-Pub. Keep up the good work, Roy. Thank you very, very much for that virtual dram. And uh, I'll raise a glass to you. I'll just click quickly on to see that I'm raising a glass to say thank you very much for your virtual dram, my friend. So is that Dilyun, Ben Rennes, or Glenn Spey? I wonder if my chat is running a wee bit slow tonight. I seem to have quite a delay in the chat. Um, Nigel Slynn thinks B, Ben Rennes. Um, Keith Corbett is saying always guess C, fantastic. <laughs> John, John Della Cuisine is saying uh, A, Tom... Uh, Tom Harris saying B, said Martin B, Hoyt B, who else? Jeremy's B, Mose and Tony also B. My friend Alan, a whiskey friend, has just sent across a virtual dram as well. Uh, thank you very much, Alan. He's saying thanks for the shout out. You're very welcome. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep bringing the passion, Alan. Keep sharing the whiskey. Thank you for your virtual drama, my friend. Let's put everyone out their misery. Do you want to you want to throw a guess at this, Scott? What do you think this is? Does it look like Dillion to you? Does it look like Ben Rennes or Glen Spey? Do you know what? I've never been to any of these three distilleries, but it looks like it's pretty high up, so I'm going to go with Ben Rennes. Great guesswork. You can see Ben Rennes in the background looking a wee bit moody. I think that's Ben Rennes up the background, but what um, stood out for me was that stack um, I, I was up there recently um, in summertime this year. I was up and we we drove past there. We saw Ben Rennes across the valley, and uh, not from this angle right enough, but that is in fact Ben Rennes. So honestly, I think that was a tricky, tricky question because um, all of those distilleries are distilleries that are kind of a, let's say they're not postcard distilleries. Um, they're made for a purpose and they're doing a purpose of making um, bulk product right now but they're also capable of making some fantastic whiskies in their own right as well so ben Rinnis, question five ralphie's whiskey of the year now we were talking about this earlier ralphie's whiskey of the year in 2017 was glenn cadam 15 year old but what was his whiskey of the year in 2016 was it a old pulteney 17 year old b ben romack 10 year old or c ard beg 10 year old Ralphie's Whiskey of the Year, we talked about this in the chat earlier. Was it A, Old Pulteney 17-year-old, B, Ben Romack 10-year-old, or C, Ardbeg 10? Lots of Ralphie fans in, I'm very, very sure. Um, <laughs> Jason Whiskey Wise answered for that pictorial question. He just answered Diageo. <laughs> 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 he'd, have, he'd have been right. <laughs> <laughs> Half a point. Glenn Spade, will you and Ben Rennes, I guess, yeah. Um, let's see, question five. So, uh, oh, oh, this is all over the place again, this one. Um, James also thinks C. Whiskey Throttle, Dram Mondays, B, along with Cast Strength, Marku. Um, who else is saying C? Keith Corbett is saying C. Jean de la Cuisine. Uh, Jimmy Jazz is saying A. Cast Strength, B. All over the place. Wow. Okay, let's see. Ralphie's Whiskey of the Year, in fact, in 2016 was our big 10 year old. Did you know that, Scott? Did not. No, I had in the back of my head it might have been Ben Romick, but no. Uh -huh. I don't. I, I think even if it was a guess, I wouldn't have guessed our big. I know. I know, right? It was actually a video that I caught quite recently and I was struck. I'd forgotten that he'd given an Ardbeg 10-year-old whiskey of the year. And I think it was uh, during his period of kind of ramming the, the thing home about age statement, about uh, the fact it's presented at 46% and these kind of things. And he chose to put this um, really kind of almost premium brand almost. Uh, and... And he was enjoying it at that time and he picked it as his whiskey of the year. But I was also thinking recently that the fact that um, that Ralphie doesn't 
engage with non-age statement whiskies anymore that two of the drams that we've shared tonight, in fact, all of the drams that we've shared tonight, he's not able to share with us. And the teapot dram that I shared a couple of weeks ago as well, he's yeah. not able to share with us. Yeah. Um, now I'm sure he's drinking them out with his videos because I would hate to think that he's uh, missing out on these whiskies that are incredible. I can understand that he's made a statement not to review them publicly, but I would hate to think that he's just blindly not drinking them. Yeah, I would. I would like. I would like to ask him if uh, if I have the opportunity to bump into him again to ask him what his opinions of uh, of these things are privately. Yeah, I'd be curious. Okay, question six. What term is given to the residual waste? Ooh, production question. What term is given to the residual waste after distillation in the spirit still? So three production terms here. Is it A, low wines, B, pot ale, or C, spent lees? What do we see um, left in the spirit still after the, the four shots, the heart, and the faints are drawn? What is left? These are tricky questions, Scott, right? Yeah, th these are tricky. These are tricky. And I think that what I have to say about these questions, I always say, is that um, James Hope is going to set a quiz for me, by the way. He's one of my supporters and viewers, and he's going to put together a 10-question quiz so that I'm on the receiving end, and I, I welcome that. I'm looking forward to that. But the idea is not to make it too easy. It's supposed to prompt curiosity and get people thinking in order to, to kind of take something away um, that might inspire them to learn a wee bit more. I don't know, you just never know. So let's see. Lots of people, um, again, all over the place on this one. Um, Dundee Drammer, A, Arbaggy, A. Uh, McCallan Fenerela Doc is saying C. Gregor um, is saying C. Uh, <laughs> Captain 3D is saying B and C. Chris Banks Wildlife, B. Wow, all over the place. Okay. What we have, um, and it's, I think it's quite difficult to reuse these, um, is spent lees. After the spirit still, we have spent lees. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the difficult things in order for distilleries to deal with in a very, very environmentally acceptable way. Um, a draft can go on to feed cattle, of course, and um, Pot oil can be recirculated, I, I believe. It can go back into the distillation process again. Uh, but spent lees are really what's left right at the very, very end, yeah. if I understand it clearly. Question seven. You might find this one a bit easier, Scott. <laughs> Earth I got fire. the last one correct, so. You, you got the last one correct? Yeah. I, I wouldn't expect anything else. <laughs> 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 Earth, fire, wood, water, and what is the fifth of Tomatin's five virtues? So this is a, a range of, uh, I just want to say thank you very, very much. Another virtual drama has come in from John Gunzel. John, I hope I'm pronouncing your surname properly. First time viewer by way of cast strength in the Whiskey Tribe. Fantastic. Sounds like you could possibly be over in the States. Thank you very much. Great show. Uh, even enjoyed some Tomatin 12 while watching. Good for you, John. It's lovely to welcome you here. Thanks for joining us. And uh, thank you very, very much from your for your virtual drama across the water. Thank you very much, John. Wow, this uh this cast strength tomatin is coming alive. Yeah. Just put a little bit of water in there. It's brightened it right up. Really enjoyable, really enjoying it now. So the fifth of Tomatin's five virtues is either A, metal, B, air, or C, sun. A, metal, B, air, or C, sun. <laughs> Drum Mondays, Christine Deans, Diogo, McCallum Fenerier, the dog, <laughs> Daniel Vermas, has, because of my delays here, um, has made it a bit easier for everyone to pick this one out. A bit of a free, free question here, a free answer. Yes, indeed, the fifth of Tomatin's five virtues is indeed metal. There we go. What is the inspiration behind the five virtues, just quickly, Scott? 
Uh, so very simply, our sales manager that looks after Asia came back to us and he was telling us about this ancient philosophy called Wu Jin. And it was basically that these five elements uh, in ancient philosophies made up life. You know, now science developed and we discovered the atom and things changed. But when you look at the way whiskey is made, what these ancient philosophies were talking about is very much what is at the core of making whiskey now. So we wanted to make a whiskey that didn't taste of these things, but embraced these things in its production. And that's what we came up with. Mm. I noticed an all non-edge statement. That's right. They're all non-edge statement. And the reason for that is that we actually used a wide range of ages in the product. And if you go to Tomatin's website, um, very much in the same way with Compass Box, you can email us or, or send a request to us and we will tell you exactly what's in that product. You know, that, that information is readily available. Any tasting I've done, I've told you absolutely what's in it. And the reason we did that is that we had whiskey ranging from about 11 years to 19 years old. And we wanted to keep it at the same price point. We wanted to keep every bottle at £50. Um, so there's some bottles we made more money on, some bottles we made less on, but it allowed it to be a very accessible uh, range so everyone could enjoy every bottle that came out. Interesting. Fine. All 46%, non-chill filtered, no colouring. The only thing that doesn't score it is that they've not got the age, but we will tell you that gladly. So with a little bit of investment on our parts, we can give it its fourth point, I guess, its fourth. Exactly. exactly. So and and more so, we'll actually give you the exact recipe breakdown. Interesting. It's kind of cool that you're doing that. Absolutely. Uh, okay, question eight. Independent bottler question. Which independent bottler started by Mark Rainier was said to be the first to pioneer acing their whiskies? Now, acing is uh, just another term that was uh, pioneered by Mark Rainier for... I think it was ex, uh, additional cask enhancement or something. I don't remember what the, the acronym was for, but it's just their term for finishing. So which independent bottler was it? A, Morrison Mackay, B, Murray McDavid, or C, Weems Maltz? Do you know this one, Scott? I don't, but I know who's involved with two of them, so I'm gonna. it's gonna be a process of elimination more than anything. I mean, I think we're I think we're going back a little while. I'm not actually sure when this was. I didn't even know until researching this question that Mark Rainey was involved in this company. It's quite interesting. I, I, um, I didn't know that he was involved in an independent bottler, if I'm being honest with you. That's right, that's right. We know the term acing from his Brook Laddie days, right? Yeah, yeah. But this is uh, when he was involved with an independent bottler. Which, when I think about the, the bottler that I have in mind, and think about some of the, the products that I've seen, that's what's leading me towards it. Okay. Potentially another banana skin for our crowd. Lots of people saying uh, B and C seems to be the two popular choices. Uh, Moses saying A. Uh, lots of people saying B and lots of people saying C. Let's have a look. Mark Rainey was involved in acing at Murray McDavid. There we go. What was your guess? Yeah, Murray McDavid. I'm, uh, I'm good friends with Peter from Morrison Mackay, so I know their yeah. background very well. And I'm good friends with Ginny from Weems, and I know the background of that company. But a company that I've not spent a lot of time with is Murray McDavid, so I'm guessing that's where that came in. Excellent. Good work. Good work on the process of elimination. Question nine, Jason Whiskey Wise has given me a little chase to say, uh, he said a few minutes ago that we were two minutes from the two hour mark. We've run over by three minutes such as the lives, such as I'm failing. Um, I have I was doing okay for a while, keeping it under two hours, but everyone for the last four or five have slipped over. But we're here for the live stream and uh, the guys who are picking it up on the replay can do so in chunks, I guess, if they're so inclined. Question nine, the mere fact that alcohol, ethanol alcohol, of course, boils before water makes distillation possible, but at what temperature does the ethanol boil? We know that water is 100%, but ethanol alcohol, does it boil off at 82.3 uh, sorry degrees centigrade, 79.8, or C, 78.4? Now, I know that we have at least one chemist um, in the audience who will potentially argue that there are uh, conditions in which this can vary, 
but I'm, I'm speaking about in a very general sense, and I'm speaking about specifically um, when we're talking about pot still distillation of whiskey. Is it A, 82.3 degrees, 79.8, or 78.4? Wow, this is what amazes me about this crowd, just how informed they are. Some people are even putting in the second decimal place. <laughs> <laughs> Quite amazing, right? These are people that have been on more distillery tours than I have. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and you've, you're responsible for uh, for giving distillery tours, yeah. hosting tours, right? Yeah. All, all I very much say is it gets hot, but at a lesser temperature than water. That's it. <laughs> well, let's see exactly how much less. It is more or less 78.4 degrees centigrade. Some places quote 78.3. But as Stephen Reynolds pointed out, it is in fact 78.37. So there we go. Super informed uh, audience again. Fantastic stuff. And the last question. So let's have a quick look in the crowd just quickly and see who who is, uh, I forgot to ask at the halfway point, who's doing well tonight? <laughs> Whiskey Throttle is screaming geeks. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely throttled. Don't you just love it? Don't you love it? Um, and the Whiskey Rev is saying 78.5 according to the IBD. Well, I don't know what the IBD is. Is that the Institute of Brewing and Distilling or something? It um, is, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, 78.5. There you go. And like I said, it's it's kind of a dependent on conditions, I know. But given the options in there, there was only one that it could have been. Um, and McAllen Fine and Rare is screaming, they looked it up. <laughs> Perhaps they've got time. Perhaps I'm not fast enough on these quizzes that people can choose to use Google. But tell me, if you're using Google to answer these questions, can you feel good after it? I think it's, it's a hollow option. victory, isn't it? Sorry? It's a hollow victory. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's nicer just to accept that some things you don't know and just learn from know. it. That's right. That's right. So let's see, where are we sitting at just now? Uh, Deepa is on one, Phil on two. Phil is winning again this week. Phil beat Deepa by one point. Wow, it's, I guess, the, I don't know if you guys came in a bit later as well. Jason Whiskey Wise on six, fantastic. Whiskey Geek, eight out of 10. Wow, you're heading for a nine out of 10 if you get the last one. Fantastic, Tom R, six. Uh, Diogo's got three, Sid Martin, five. McAllen Fine, Rear the Dock, eight out, of, eight out of nine, fantastic. Jeremy Sims, six. Castrend, six. Some decent scores here. Gregor's on a seven. Um, wow. Christine Deems, one fantastic Christine, eight out of nine. That's unbelievable. I actually was suspicious that tonight's quiz would be close to as difficult as last week's, but absolutely not. Maybe it was only going to be difficult for me. Let's go into the last question then. Muckle Flugger, Scotch whiskey, inherits its name from what? I don't know if anybody's heard of the brand of Scotch whiskey called Muckle Flugger, but it's a sourced product, of course. It's not a distillery, um, but it is a brand, but it inherits its name from what? Is it A, a 19th century novel, B, an illegal fighting practice, or C, an island in the far north? Muckle Flugger. Do you have a feeling about this one, Scott? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's how it sums it up. Yeah. Is it educated guesswork again? Very much. Um, if it does take its name from what I think, then it's only a very small part of its name. Okay. And okay. I'll wait till the answer comes in before revealing my guess. So. Sure, sure, that's fine. Question 10. Um, C's mostly a couple of bees and Geichen is in uh or is it Gochen? i always uh, I'm, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name mike good to see you and it's nice to welcome you here that's the first time i've seen you in a little while wonderful to have you here um is saying b uh jimmy jazz is also saying b along with jean de la cuisine and uh but the majority seem to be suggesting that it is c so let's put everyone out of their misery, including Scott. Muckle Flugga takes its name from an island in the far north. Can I see that fist pump again? <laughs> you let your humility drop for a second there. For a slight second, yeah. <laughs> it Fantastic. was the Isle of Muck. 
That's right. It's a, a tiny little island in Shetland, apparently, that hosts a lighthouse, and that's where it takes its name from. So Muckle Flugger is, I believe, a source product. It's a blend and also a single malt source, single malt. But they do actually take the casks to ship to Shetland and mature them there for a season, I guess, in the hope. Much the same in the la question 10 from last week was talking about a very interesting concept. I don't know if you'd heard of this, Scott, from 1922 where a, a Kregelche distillery shipped 2,300 casks from Speyside to Campbelltown just to mature them and, and to impart some maritime provenance on the casks. I watched that quiz and I thought that was fascinating because you think of cask influence only really being understood as the biggest influencer in the last maybe 10 years. So for them to be doing that in the 1920s, or maybe 20 years, but for them to be doing that in the 1920s is mental. But what I would say is on that last question there, B could very easily be the correct answer because I'm sure when I've walked out of the pubs in the north of Scotland, I've seen a couple of muckle fluggers. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Do you know what? I have to be careful with these things because when I'm inventing answers, there is a there is a chance that you could just could happen upon right. something, right? That it could be close. So, are you willing to admit your score and go up against uh, our crowd? Because Christine deems you star. Christine got a nine out of ten tonight. Is there anybody else that can match nine out of ten? Absolutely amazing score, Christine. I know you always do very very well. Lots of eight out of tens as well. I'm looking for the doc, McAllen fine and rare. Nine out of ten changed my mind at the last second regarding the picture. I was parking there in September. Oh, you'll be gutted, Doc. So a nine out of ten matching Christine Deem's excellent score, Doc. Fantastic. And let's go over to Scott. I got right? an eight out of ten tonight. Eight out of ten. Fantastic. I'm not ashamed to say that on last week's one that you did with Phil and Deepa, I got four. You know, I think it's, it, you know what you know. Yes, absolutely. And I think last week's was one of the hardest quizzes that's been put together, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, I actually thought that it was going to be quite difficult again this week, but some fantastic scores. A fantastic score from you, Scott, as well. Well done, 8 out of 10. Brilliant. And Christine Deems and the Doc seem to be the guys taking the laurels tonight with 9 out of 10. Scott, let's just uh, quickly tell people how they can get in touch with you if they have any more questions, if they want to arrange uh, something up at Tomatin. Um, so absolutely comment on uh, the video that we've got here and I'll answer any questions. Um, but if you want to engage with me in a bit more detail, uh, you'll find me on Instagram. It's at scotch underscore Adamson. So scotch instead of Scott. Um, that's purely because there's too many people called Scott that work at Tomatin. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, shoot me any messages you want, whether it's about any questions or if you're planning coming up to the distillery, let me know. If you're going to a whiskey festival that I might be attending, let me know. And absolutely, let's have a whiskey at some point. Fantastic. And I need to make that trip as well myself. I would like to come up. And um, like I say, Tomatin is one of the brands that so many of what you're doing um, we very much enjoy so much, so much of it I can engage with. Still very, very much a now whiskey when it comes to value. So much of the product that they're putting out there is still very, very affordable for most of us. Like I say, um, and I don't say this lightly, that Tomatin Legacy will probably be a staple in my cabinet for a long time to come. Because when you're sharing something with people come to come to the house and they know you're a whiskey person and they're looking for some guidance, you need something that's accessible, something that's easy to drink, something that's not too expensive, and something that you know that you can trust in. And I feel that Tomatin Legacy is one of the non-age statements out there that gives us that, along with so many others that I like to evangelize about when I have the opportunity as well. It was an absolute pleasure to have a like-minded uh, whiskey enthusiast, dare I say whiskey geek, uh, such as yourself, Scott, on here tonight. It was a pleasure to hang out with you. Um, Thank you for having me. Next week, it'll just be me on my own, I believe. Um, there's a couple of um, collaborations that I'm trying to tee up, but we're coming into that period that it's going to get pretty busy and hectic for everybody's schedules. I know it's already tricky for me to, to continue these weekly streams throughout December, but I'm entirely committed to them, and I'm looking forward to welcoming you all next week, which will be, I believe, a... Uh, uh, 
a non-typical date. It would be the second and the last Thursdays for me normally. Next week, I think, is the third. But I'll advertise it and I'll give everyone reminders where I can. Thanks to everybody for joining me tonight. Thank you to my uh, stellar support guys, Jason Whiskey Wise and uh, the Whiskey Rev, who I noticed had to dip out a wee bit earlier. I hope everything's okay at his side and he's still around. I did do some Christmas shopping this week and these are two guys that I have looked after. Um, I would like everybody to appreciate the job that they do, handling the quiz, uh, handling the comments, keeping me on track from time to time. And it's just nice to know that there's often somebody out there. Fantastic, Jason and Graham, the Whiskey Rev. Wonderful to have you in again. Thanks so much to you, Scott, for joining me tonight, for staying here for the full duration. Two hours, 15 minutes of it, and you're still here. Wonderful to hang out together. And I hope that it's not the last time. Oh, definitely not. No, I, I think we could have talked for four or five hours into the wee, for, into the wee hours of tomorrow. Um, so let's do this again at some point. Maybe if you have the opportunity to come down in Glasgow, we can we can share a dram in town or something like that. Thanks so much to everybody for joining. I'll see you a week from now. Please pick up the Scotch for Dummies after the show. And if there's anything I've forgotten, chase me up as well as Scott in the comments underneath. Thank you so much. And until next time, slancher.